Um, thanks, everyone, and welcome back. Hope the summers are going well as we're winding down. Everyone had some summer fun uh, and um, got a little needed break from school board and other work. Uh, yeah, opening the um, August 15th uh, meeting of the school board at 4.07. Uh, so today we're having a, our summer retreat and try to keep on schedule. Um, just a couple of reminders. Um, first, we're getting a data presentation on disproportionality. Uh, then we're going to um, spend some time with our top priorities of the board. I think the idea here is to kind of do a, uh, whatever you do when you put little dots on a, on a thing. Yes. And then we'll, we'll kind of sort out. I, I think, you know, the idea is to kind of get the top few uh, and then establish a decision making process uh, for how we want to kind of handle big things. Uh, you know, the, this has arisen because we've had you know, some big decisions where we just haven't had a lot of guidance about you know, how and when to engage the community. Uh, you know, we've had, I think, some decisions that have had a lot of process behind them, um, but that process has not necessarily felt satisfactory to everyone involved. And also, uh, I won't say the process was, was ad hoc, but it was, we didn't necessarily have a protocol to follow uh, as, as we went through. Um, and I think that was a source of, of very understandable frustration, both to board members and, and to community members. So, um, so we want to give some time to how we want to confront big decisions, like some of the decisions we had, like, you know, I think the track and some of the budget decisions we made come to mind. Um, with that, uh, I think one of the things I just want to put out is a warning. Uh, we want to put our top priorities out there, and then we want to kind of come up with you know a process for how we approach some of those priorities and other priorities that might come at us that that you know are kind of out of our control. Um, I think to keep us on time and on schedule, you will have plenty of time to talk about the substance of those priorities and just to throw out a hypothetical. If, say, a priority of ours is a discussion with Wash Central about possible opportunities for merger cooperation down the road, um, we do not need to discuss the substance now. We'll have plenty of time to do that then, but we might want to give some parameters about you know, how and when we want to reach out to the community over that type of decision. Um, and I think with that, uh, I will, any other comments before we start? Um, with that, I'll open it up to, oh, one, one other thing I want to note. Um, first, I want to thank Kristen Gettler for her amazing service on the board. Uh, she was with us for a while uh, and through some a period that was very tough for the Roxburgh community and continues to be tough for the Roxburgh community. Uh, she put in a ton of hours and showed a ton of leadership and compassion. Um, both during that time and, and before that. Uh, uh, so she has, she has left the board as of July 12th, so I really want to thank her for all the great work she did, and I really hope she stays very involved as a community member and, and parent, um, and I'm sure she will. Uh, but with her leaving, we have uh, an opening uh, for uh, one of the two uh, Roxbury slots. Um, and so if anyone is interested, uh, please send a letter to me or Libby. Uh, we are going to try to fill that as soon as we can. Um, right now we have not had any interest. I think some word has been put out, but uh, we could probably do a better job of, of broadcasting that. Uh, so again, anyone from the Roxburgh community uh, interested in um, you know, serving the community and, and being on the board, which I think is going to be a very important time as we uh, integrate uh, Roxbury students into UES uh, and also, you know, face, I think, some, some critical decisions both with the budget and our, our buildings and other things. So uh, a really important role and, um, you know, having uh, the community of Roxbury fully represented on this board is really important. And right now we only have one of, of two slots filled. So please express interest if you are interested. Um, 
All right, with that, uh, public comment, and I'm not seeing anyone in the room who is not a staff member, but it looks like we do not have anyone online. Um, so let's move to the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda um, is uh, where we approve uh, pro forma items that um, are routine matters of business uh, that generally do not require discussion. It allows us to get a lot of work done quickly. Uh, and if there's any questions about uh, any of the items, uh, board members can pull them off for discussion. But generally, there are things like approval of minutes, uh, approval of, of hires that the, the uh, administration um, has forwarded to us, et cetera. Um, so with that, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move we approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Any discussion or questions about the consent agenda? No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great, consent agenda passes. Um, and now uh, we have Mike and others, a whole great team here to talk about uh, disproportionality data training, uh, which we've been wanting for a while because it really helps us figure out um, you know, how our um, you know, how, how to read data and how it affects um, our students uh, and kind of break them in and out in, in various uh, groups. Oh, that's cold, team. That's cold. Small table. <laughs> it's cold. Oh, yeah, and if you had to pull chairs up, that's fine. Too. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need Mike We're sitting, here for support. Sitting, <laughs> sitting lonely and abandoned at a Sorry. small desk. We get so much desk. bonding this yeah. summer, too. That desk looks extra small, too. It's kind of <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, <laughs> kind of funny. Um, so thanks for having us. Um, we are here to talk about disproportionality. Just to manage expectations, we're going to spend about 90% of time kind of working with the board on what is disproportionality and only this much looking at our data. Um, and that's exactly where we are with the admin team as well. So a little bit of context. Um, we first learned about disproportionality and um, this fellow, Edward Fergus, through the equity audit. Um, and then through the work that Jess has been doing a stellar job on with our equity planning, um, we've been digging deeper into it. And it's, it's complicated and exciting and energizing and challenging and heavy and all those things all at once. So we are really taking our time to understand it at a different level. Um, with the admin team, we actually did three trainings leading up to what we're going to take you through today before we even talked about it. Um, we worked on bias training around colorblindness, deficit thinking, and poverty discipline as ways for us to understand the data that we're looking at. Um, so this is, this is kind of this, this is the same process we went through with the admin team about a month ago, maybe Spring. more. Spring. Yeah. Um, we're going to take you through it today. Okay. So there's some community agreements here. Um, you know, just for us as a group, this is, this is heavy stuff. Um, balance accountability and grace, stay engaged even when it gets uncomfortable. Um, we kept confidentiality in there even though it's a public meeting. Um, grant permission for collective breath, step up, step back, expect and expect, accept non-closure, be curious, combat defensiveness, and notice flushes. Where, where are things impacting you? Where are things helping you to think and, and bringing up emotions. So what today is and isn't about, today is about stretching our skills and strategies around data. We're going to actually practice with some data that's not ours. Um, understand the concept of disproportionality, make connections to past discussions, and identify different systemic levels of data analysis. What today isn't about, and is probably the most challenging thing, is solving the problems we see and jumping into solutions and actions. That's not what we're doing today at all. Um, and that's the work that we're continuing to do. So what is disproportionality? Disproportionality references the over-representation or under-representation of a certain population when compared to other sections of the population. And there's a chart there that's nice and small so that you can really, really see it that focuses on the things that cause 
disproportionality. Um, what this data tells us is where we have certain populations overrepresented and underrepresented. And so it's a really interesting way to think about the data that we have. We can go on to that, yeah. And just, Mike, sorry to interrupt you. I, in your agenda, board members, there's this, the link to this, correct? Yeah. yeah the yeah. link to the, There it, should be, yeah. Just to, for ease of eyes, yeah. Yeah, I might have to borrow Peggy Sue's reader. But yeah, you want to? No, I'm good. <laughs> I forgot mine. Um, so there's three different components when we think about equity work. There's numerical, which kind of names that outcome that we want changed. So if we have a percentage of students here, we want to get to this percentage. That's what that's referring to. There's a social justice component that's about access or opportunity to achieve or change. And then there's the cultural and belief components and that belief framework of what is causing these systemic challenges and changes in behavior and things like that. So what we are going to do as a group is you're going to actually get up and move a little bit. Um, and we have four uh, sample case studies. If we can go to the next slide, there we go. We have four different case studies for you to practice looking at disproportionality. Case study one is about recognizing discipline patterns. Case study two is suspensions, live in referrals. Case study four is fixing academic referrals leading to special education classification. And case study five is high special education classification doesn't happen overnight. And so what's going to happen here is I'm going to give you a paper scenario, and you and a partner are going to discuss it and see what you see. One of us will be with you. Um, just to help facilitate the conversation a little bit. After a while, we'll give you a paper that outlines what Edward Fergus would recommend you see in this scenario. You'll have a little discussion about what you saw, what the recommendation is, and then I have two questions for you to answer to think about systemic and um, cultural beliefs to kind of prompt that discussion. Then each group will report out on their scenario and what they saw. Does that make sense? Any, any questions about that? OK, we wanted to give choice here. So it would be groups of two, including Libby, and one group of three. But those are the four case studies. I'm going to give case study one to Nick, uh, case study two to Peggy Sue, Case study four will be Jess, and then case study five will be me. And we'll spread out in the room. You choose which one you would like, and we'll, we'll give you a, a, some time to do that. Does that make sense? Are we good with microphones? Do I have to do anything special with that? I think it's just going to be the way it is. OK. Libby, should, should you send me to a breakout room? Sure. And somebody who could join Zoom, I can join them. Sure. Would that be the easiest way to handle um, me? Let me see if I can oh. do that. Okay. Yeah. Hold on, I gotta stop sharing. Um, I don't know if that's going to be easy for me to do. <laughs> my my jack okay. of all trades behind is not behind the scenes is not with us, so um, I'm not sure. I'm just no, I'm not just not sure. I can, I don't see how to make a breakout room in the webinar. So. It you know what I can do out. is I'll just mute, keep myself muted, and then whatever group I'm in, I will call oh. that board member on the phone. That sounds good. Thanks, Mia. I just don't want my voice to, because I, whenever I talk, right, to I feel loud. Over. Yes. Yeah, more or less. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll be as a member of the three because I have dinner to order, so I don't want to leave a person oh, partnerless. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. All right, so who wants to talk about suspensions? <laughs> I'll go with that. Yeah, I'll go with suspensions. Okay. Oh, like, I'll, I'll come to you. How about okay. that? Okay. Together. I love interpreting. 
Here, I'll stick with you two. Discipline patterns? Discipline. Sure. Okay. Amani, do you have a choice? Why don't you you want to hang out with Brett and Nick? Heck yeah. <laughs> Academic referrals leading to special ed. I'm gonna vote. Yeah, we'll I told you. It. Oh. Okay. High special education class remains as an absent overnight class. Uh, Where do we go? Where do we go? All right, I'm going to order. I'll be right here. Uh, which one are you? I think we need one. Probably not need both. Here, okay, bring in yours. My battery is going to die if I. percentage proportion of black students goes down in both suspension and referrals, but if you look at the number of students in those, it also goes down, yeah. so it may not actually be that the percentage of black students being referred or suspended is... Are you in our group? Well, I think another thing to think about is only 34% of the population right. is black, but 73% of the suspensions, even when it yeah. goes down to 64, right, mm -hmm. is way higher than... And it, yeah. kind of, it kind of shoots back up. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's, it's clearly... African-American students are being suspended at a far right. higher rate than white students. Right. And the counter of that, right, is that 45% of the students are white, but the percentage of, of suspensions that are white students is significantly lower than 45%. Right. So if we were, if everything was non-biased, I guess, for like this, right, we would think that 45% of the suspensions would be white, right? Like these. We would think these percentages would be pretty close to what the percentage of the population is. Um, and then behavioral. Similar way. Sure, it's, yeah. The other um, population. High, but it's hard to know what their overall percentage is, right? Students with disabilities are very reduced. Mm -hmm. So, all mm -hmm. students, I'm reading this right, 229 students in 2011 were suspended. And 190 of those were the free and reduced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. yeah. Interesting to see how should that 
how these groups correlate. Yeah, I mean, for instance, what's the percentage difference of African American students versus white students in free and reduced lunch? So, are we seeing, is it just racial issues or are we also seeing issues of, of poverty and family structure coming into play? Right. Yeah, so my first. Yeah, so 190 students out of 15. Yeah, I can't do that math. <laughs> it's, it's been a long week. So, like, most of, I mean, most for pretty much all years, like, the vast majority of students who were suspended are in the free and reduced lunch program. So, if we take race out of it, it's clear that socioeconomic status is a huge factor in that. And African Americans are also you know, disproportionately, very disproportionately represented as well. The behavioral referral data on the second page is similar. Yeah. Where do you see the behavioral? Second page? Yeah. This is how oh, yeah. So when we look at these, are just number they didn't do it by, you know, look at the numbers. So clearly there appears to be a racial bias. And the question is how much that racial bias is separated from the bias against kids from lower socioeconomic families. We'd have to know the percentage difference between African Americans and free to reduce lunch. And Right. And white students yeah. Right, so part of it is yeah. we would want yeah. to have yeah. more information. Right? Yeah. Like that. All right, yeah. here's the information that he wants us to clean from it. What's what's the stronger thing going on? Is it the kids from lower income families are more disproportionately and they happen to be black, or is it the black kids are more disproportionately? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's probably like some of both, but how strong is both? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I think if you were to take this con, I think when we talked about this in our leadership team, if you were to take this context into Vermont, the it would not correlate necessarily no. much at all. Our black population is so small, but um, they're also in our district. Our black population are not majority free and reduced lunch, yeah. which is interesting. All right, so there are a couple of questions for group to answer individually. Well, let me <laughs> so it's really thinking about this, what are the policies that we should look at, practices, processes, and then what are the 
social justice or issue concerns. Yeah. I am curious too, looking at just the students with disabilities, just wondering what the percent of the population that, you know, for me, we're at like 18% of the people in the district. 19% are disabilities and 83% are free reduced lunch of the kids who are suspended. What was the three? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's very high. So that's even more significant than black as the black as the right. only indicator, right? But yeah, that there's that cross reference. Well, with those numbers, now that I'm like understanding what I'm looking at, I'm like not coming in cold. Would those numbers I mean if there's 229 students, I'm looking at 2011 for instance, if yeah. 229 students, all students, yeah. were suspended, yeah. 168 of those suspensions were of a, a black student, yeah. and 190 yeah. were a white student, mathematically, wouldn't they correlate? Or wouldn't they, wouldn't they overlap? They definitely have to be overlap. Right? Yeah. Just mathematically? <laughs> I'm guessing. Julie's my math person, so I'm not about and actually, that, now you say that, it's interesting to look at, because if you look at the next year, the number of black students suspended went down pretty significantly, and also pretty pre reduced lunch. lunch. The difference between those two numbers and both of those. Mm -hmm. Not with the... And the suspensions of non-black went up. Right. <laughs> so, some of the processes, practices, and policy areas to be examined. Um, one might be what justifies a suspension. Is that formalized? Is it? Right, that would be a good thing to figure out. What are the criteria for that would justify that? Mm -hmm. And what qualifies as a behavioral problem? Right, very yeah. similar. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that we need to keep honing in on is the people are, you know, we have in Panorama, you know, like certain behaviors, yeah. but if you don't, like people have different tolerance, you know, like I spent 12 years in day treatment, so it takes a lot, for, you know, for me to like feel like, oh, that's, you know, disrespectful or, you know, whatever. So if you don't have that, like, making sure that everyone's interpreting that the same, then it really can skew how your data goes to. That was the intervention measures when you do have a behavioral issue. Mm -hmm. What happens before? I think, I think who's making the decision matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the relationship between the student and teacher involved matters quite a bit too. And also, yeah, like, really what's the, the more importantly than what okay. like, yeah. equally importantly is how is, so how is that some some brought back in? Like, what is the process after suspension to try to keep happening again? Mm -hmm. I think it's also like where are the behavioral issues happening? Yeah. Um, Or is it like on a bus? I mean, say you have a community that's kind of segregated, and a lot of them are busted. And it's like a long bus ride, and there's a lot of behavioral issues on the bus. And they come in, and they might 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 come in
that could be a lot of factors. Yeah. 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 Ye
first fully that, okay, there's some disproportionality here. We need to accept that. Now we need to explore why there's disproportionality. And we need to measure our responses to it to see if it's changing the disproportionality at all. Um, which is what we're really excited about, is that we have a way to measure whether our efforts are making a difference or not, um, for once. Because it feels like in a, a lot of our equity conversations, we are well-intentioned and we put things in place, but we don't have a clear kind of impact measure um, specific to the demographic groups that we're trying to support and or the policies that we're changing or the systems that we're changing. So to answer your question, it's all going to be wrapped up in the equity plan and the work that Jess is doing with the community and the admin and you all and families and groups. It's not going to be something that will come back and say, here's what the admin did. It's going to be, here's what our community discovered by looking at this question. It's going to be a long conversation. It's going to be a long, long process. Do you guys, when you see something like this in our district's data, is do you like start, you know, like do you do you look for like the simple explanations first? Like suppose you had like a a, a teacher who referred, you know, had of the students she sent to the principal's office, 75% were boys and 25% were girls, right? Mm -hmm. Then then obviously disproportionality, right? Boys are being sent at three times the rate. But what if you then found out that uh, in her class, 75% of students are boys and 25% are, are girls. Right, that, that would be important information. So, I mean, is that what the kind of thing that you guys do? It's like, first you look for kind of like the, the straightforward things to like sort of confirm your hypothesis. Well, first, this is new to us. We have never done disproportionality data before. Okay. So this is all new, and it's heavy, and it's big. Is That's it? why we're taking it slow. So I don't have an example of how we use disproportionality data in the past to dig into it mm -hmm. to see what's going on. But in that example, you have, that's a great example. We would look at those details and say, you know, is there something specific here that's kind of impacting this? And we would look at those things. Um, what we tend to do with data like this is the 30,000 foot up view because this is, you know, this isn't a single classroom or particular teacher that we can say what's going on in this group of 14 kids. But we look at this systemically, and this is what, why we're trying to focus on policies and processes and systems versus, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to take Jimmy from this classroom and we're going to change this with this kind of data. Yeah, I mean, like, for me, questions one and two are actually kind of far down the line, mm -hmm. like, end of the process. Like, for me, I would want, you know, as a data person, I'd want to, like, kind of see what else could how other what other ways can we slice it and investigate it um, you know because you know there could be a social justice oriented concern definitely in here but like it's first like you know what are what are the other possible explanations like you know are there lurking variables um, that kind of a thing mm -hmm. But again, what we're talking about with disproportionality is the simple question of, is, is there disproportionality? Yes. Period. Right. And we have to resist the urge to go too far past that immediately. We're making an assumption that there's disproportionality. I think everybody assumes there's disproportionality. We don't necessarily know how bad it is or how big it is until we look at this data. And then that gives us a sense of where we really need to start asking some tough questions. But in the case of like the teacher example, you know, first blush, yes, there's disproportionality, but then, you know, you look at some other data of like what is the competition. We now make up more than half of our custodial team, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. And I've given them like credit for their military service and their translating services, like the, in Afghanistan, like I gave them credit on the salary scale for that. But then it's like, but you're a teacher, <laughs> you know, who also was airlifted out because of their service to the U.S. military, right? So all of every single one of them, that is why they're here. It's not, and, like, I see it all on their resume. And I'm like, and now you're emptying my trash. Like, that's what you're doing right now. And I appreciate that we can give you the job, 
and I will pay you as much as I can possibly can underneath our contract. Yes. And you shouldn't have to do this, yes. <laughs> you know? Like, this, is, this should not be what you're doing. Are we going to come back together, please? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look at my face. Well, and what, I mean, it seems like this district seems to do a really good job with some of the free and reduced lunch challenges, like we were from when I was at AOE. Like, we look at, at test data and stuff like that, but like, I feel like you guys do a really incredible job with like food and connection. We were hard at it, but we got a lot of we got a lot of work to go. Yeah, I think the food thing uh, just across the state has become a more like people are realizing yeah, it's kind of hard. You know? Yeah, um, and so like I think these boxes honestly, we were given out this summer were great. From I was like, I was like, man, I could do that. I could eat yeah. this. Like yeah. they were like fresh broccoli and yeah, uh, that was great that he did that. And he did it all up and down 89, like in different towns. Wow, yeah, it was great. He did it so his food service yeah. worked all summer. Yeah. That's what they, they did. But yeah, the state of Vermont is done well yeah. with, with that piece of the puzzle. Yeah. We have a long way to go with academic achievement, certainly with our free and reduced lunch population. Huh? Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting here, we talk about, we've talked about this all the time because we talked a lot this summer about our equity plan is that our teachers, many of our teachers are really passionate about talking about anti-racism and our BIPOC students, which is great. And they do not want to talk about free and reduced lunch. It's just not something that is on their brains as, as important. It's, it's a little less visual. And it's a much, it's, yeah, exactly. Much bigger number, <laughs> much bigger number. <laughs> Like when I worked in Shelburne, it was you know the incredibly wealthy people in Shelburne, and then there was a homeless shelter in Shelburne. Where you guys had a lot, yeah. Domestic violence victims get brought to Vermont, and so we had this dichotomy that was just you know, and most of the teachers in Shelburne lived in Shelburne or somewhere around, and they just had no, they just couldn't. And I was like, okay, I guess, like, you need to go somewhere besides Shelburne. Like, yeah, go spend some time in the Northeast Kingdom. Like, no, like. Didn't you have a high multilingual population there too? Yeah. We've worked really hard on suspensions, so suspensions is a place yeah. that we've gotten much better at over the last couple of years. The challenge is more from a parent community, a parent who knows their child has been harmed in some way because of just the process. I want that kid gone. Like, all restorative conversation goes out the window when There's your kids, oh, yeah. you and your kids, right. been harmed, which is an understandable right. reaction. Yeah. And at the same time, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That might be positive. Bye. Yeah. Okay, Mike.
Yeah, first confirm uh, is this thing that we're seeing. There's a lot of happy with girls in com. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Is your um is your tattoo someone who has written that? Like so my grandmother, who is almost ninety seven. This is her handwriting, and she used to write that all the time on all our cards and everything. And oh. she is still alive, but she is like a child at this point. Like, she has no memory. Every time we show it to her, it's brand new. She's like, I did that? Like, no, you didn't write on us. Yeah. Right. So um, in December, there were like six of us that decided, like, we shouldn't wait till she dies. We should do this while she's still alive. So yeah, so we like got it. Yeah. Yeah. She's great. But it's just yeah. 27. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. It's funny, and I'm probably like Jake's worst nightmare in a former life when I was a lawyer, and I would be putting on a case where I would specifically tell a story with data that was consistent with the client's objectives, right? Like when I was trying to make a point using a substantial amount of data, I would, I would set up my chart and set up my table in a way that illustrated the point and brought that out more so that, you know, not telling a story yeah. and so that's that's why I always like I, I get I'm really cautious when I see yeah. these kind of presentations because I'm often thinking like it, it, not that it's nefarious or you know just people come with whatever they come with to the table yeah. mm -hmm. um, like what are the pre um, presumptions and belief systems that are that this house of data is built upon and I think what I'm trying to present to you is that this data that you're going to see tonight is free of those presumptions. It's just the data. Is there disproportionality according to your raw data in the system? It doesn't attempt to explain why. It doesn't say that this is what's causing it. It doesn't say any of that. It's just yes or no. Is there disproportionality in your numbers based on your raw data? But if you slice the numbers a different way, would you still see it? I don't think so. I don't think you can slice these numbers a different way because this is number of kids, number of IEDs, demographics. Yeah, yeah. it's not. Um, do they have parent advocates? Any of those things? It's just answering that question: is is there disproportionality? It's not saying that it's necessarily evil disproportionality or terrible disproportionality. It just is there disproportionality? But can one table prove disproportionality? I believe so. Out on that for me, yeah. I'm curious to see this. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, in some ways, like the data work, even though you know it, it feels tedious, is easier than the change in the world work. Like the change in the world work is massive. You yeah. know, um, the data work is like people sitting at their computers and. Yeah, 100% agree with that. Yeah. We gotta have something. And we have to do the second work. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's really interesting. I really appreciate you leading it. You know, it's great work. Thanks, Mike. So we'll see some time. Yeah. Jim, just play fan up. All right, Mia. Hey, guys. Thank you. That was great. Where are you, Mia? I see you. Where are you? There you go. Yeah. We're good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Back to the room. I don't know where she is. I guess so. I did see pizzas coming, so I don't know if that might be a... If there might be... Yeah. Yeah, where are you? Did you say, Mia? Yeah. I'm in Door County, Wisconsin. Oh, well, I've been there. Okay. <laughs> how, do you like, great, right? how do you like it? I love it. I love it. We, we yeah. come here almost every year. My mom has a place. Oh, right. Oh, nice. Awesome. Um, is it still cherry season, or is that over? Oh yeah, you can. Yeah, there's a lot of them out there. Nice. Like sour cherries are like they're kind of sweet there. Sweet cherry. Both like, kinds. Yeah, uh, you can find tart ones. Huh. Both kinds. Maybe. Cool. Yeah. <sighs> but it's it's pouring rain outside right now, so timing is perfect for me to get by. Oh yeah. It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> cool. Nice. Sounds good. All right, we'll let you go. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Okay, we got this picture and tell me what that box is.
what it is? Yeah. yeah. What do you mean, like what kind of architecture? Why? No, why do you know yeah, that? The house? bank made me when I built all our Why do I know it? How old are you? Like three inches above the 100 years Um, 44? Yeah. yeah. Why do you know that? House? Why do we're, I, we're roughly the same age. Yeah, well, apparently the next year. Okay, so it's from some movie. Or, 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 or something insinuating. He's continuing the first part. It's so funny. Huh. Some movie yeah. um, yes. from so our I youth. Grew up in St. Um, I, I, I haven't seen every movie, not or, or show, or show. I don't know. Cosby uh, Show. Full House. Full House. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't watch a lot of Full House. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think we're going to return to the next phase of the presentation. Use the loo. Yeah. And get a little space between us and the bio parents. Yeah. Yeah. How old is she? 11 and 12. 11. And then my oldest is 25. Yeah, he's the one that went to Riverside. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes it is. <laughs> All right, I guess I gotta go back. I don't want to be on screen, so. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Libby's the one to get. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. Food in. Yeah, that was. That was a big. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So, thank you for those discussions. Um, if we had time, we would have some reporting out, but that's all right. I'd rather have, have you have time in those groups than, than lose that. Um, what I'd like to show you next is really going back to disproportionality is talking about what disproportionality is. So disproportionality is the over or under representation of a group compared to other groups of students in different areas of school life. So what I have for you is a document that has a uh, cheat sheet on what disproportionality is on Edward Fergus, on the formulas, where everything comes from. You can kind of blur your eyes when you look at this. Um, but on the next page is our, our district's data from the spring. And just to explain a couple of things, when you see these numbers, they're going to be the relative risk ratio, which is the risk of a group in relation to the other groups. There are three different measures we get from Edward Ferguson's work. We get risk index, which tells about the population and the likelihood of something happening. We get the composition index, which is just what's your data, what's the percentage of these groups in different categories. And then the relative risk ratio is the one that we really want to pay attention to. We want to see whether groups are overrepresented or underrepresented. So anytime that you see something above a one, that's overrepresented. A one is level, and below one is underrepresented. So for example, in the data that you're going to see, <clears throat> American Indian students are twice as likely to be classified with disabilities in our district currently compared to the other demographic groups. And you'll be able to go through this and look at different things. The first page is students with disabilities. And the second page is disproportionality according to discipline. So you'll be able to take a look at it. And again, today was about practicing this discussion. And it's terribly tempting to look at these numbers and start to solve problems and figure out what's going on. We're taking that slow and as a community to really understand that. One of our next steps is to update this data with new student information from this, the start of this year. 
Um, and as I was saying in, in my group, this is not quick work. So we want to do it right, and we want to take it seriously. And we want to put Nick in a dark room with a spreadsheet for seven hours. And that's how we'll get this done. Um, but I will pass these out so you can take a look at them, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. And I think this is linked in the presentation, too. Food is here. I don't know if we want to take a couple minutes and get it now, or wait until this is over and the party setting. It's kind of nice now that the screen has the, the projection up instead of our faces. So if you want to eat now and now, sure. the that's the way to think about it. Right. Nice thought, thought. Yeah, you can use it if you hit control and then the plus sign. And there might also be a way to do it in the I can only do that on by accident. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Did you? There's three salads over there, too. Yeah. Mike, I missed the task. Our task is to read through some of this. Yeah, I kind of lumped the last six slides together. Okay. Um, I think probably a good next step would just be to to sit with this and answer those two questions about what kind of policy, procedural and systems thinking do we need to think about from this data? And it could actually could be a part of the priority discussion too, I think. And then, um, you know, what are the social justice concerns that we may want to ask about by looking at this data? So they're kind of sharing out. Just, they have our data at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the big difference is the vignettes. 
but they also yeah. he has better um, activities on that end. So it's more of an activity than a no. Well, it's it's very action oriented. So challenging biases in our schools. So he has actions for schools to take. Some of them are mine, but most are new. Yes, indeed. Mike, I have a question while I'm looking at this. If it's a 0, 0. 0.00 relative risk, what does that mean? If it has the number sign div slash zero or zero zero, it means there was no comparative data for that section. Okay. Yep. And just as a reference point for anybody else who's following along at home or watching this later, um, so the data that Mike is sharing with the board right now is a, can be found by clicking the link in the very last slide, I think. Yes. From the slide presentation that is in the board packet. That's correct. Yep. So I guess and just then you do need to read her. <laughs> yeah, it's easier to see on the computer for sure. Um, just to leave you with something for your priority discussions, I think, um, and it's extremely hard to look at this and not want to go deeper and not want to go bigger. But I've said this a few times. You know, this data is about: is there disproportionality? Yes or no. It's our job to ask some tough questions beyond that, and you can see some of the questions in the relative risk. Um, ratios box to the right in, on those sheets that can really help prompt some good conversations. Um, some of the things that Peggy Sue and I did when we were working on this data was um, really look at the different um, categories of disability as well as looking at time in classroom, least restrictive space, all of those things to really parse out the data in ways that we could kind of ask some tough questions of ourselves and what's going on. And we saw some really interesting trends. Again, when you look at numbers that are above 1.0, those are the numbers of overrepresentation in those populations. So they just prompt some good questions. And then on that second page, the same with discipline, um, you can start to ask some good questions about the categories and what the trends are and the patterns that we see. And I think that's, that's kind of where we would leave you for this first dip into disproportionality, to just take it in, see what questions you have. And it would be the first of many. I mean, this is something that we're going to talk about for a long time. And I know Jess has worked hard to, to incorporate it into our equity planning and our thinking. Um, yes? Who's the American? American Indians. Yeah, it's shortened. I apologize, the format. There's a lot of data, yeah. and so we just took um, screenshots from our spreadsheets, okay. and so some things were shortened. And by American Indian, do you need Native American or Americans of, like, Indian descent, of, like, continental Indian? Native American. Native American. This is, these are the federal classifications. Uh -huh. Sound okay for now? Exit stage right while everyone eats pizza? Mm -hmm. yes. <coughs> Sustenance for a long meeting. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for the team before we leave this for right now? Like Mike said, we'll come back to this. Lots of times. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mia. Okay. Um, uh, you've just shown us um, references to um, dis uh, um, dis sorry discipline as well as um, 
you know, special education. When you do begin to show us data in this way, will we also see, say, the category of belonging? Yeah, we're working on how to incorporate that. We have a lot of that data <laughs> wrapped up in something we're calling the opportunity gap that we want to be able to present to you folks as well. Um, okay. So belong, belonging will be there in some capacity. Um, we'd have to think about how it would work into the disproportionality formulas. Mm -hmm. But we will definitely be presenting on belonging data incorporated with all Great. this. Great. Yeah. Is special education referrals, is that how we're thinking about academic, or would there also be a category around academic achievement and disproportionality in there? Yeah, yeah, we have the opportunity gap um, data around um, demographics and race and ethnicity as well that will show some of that. The tools that we were using for disproportionality from Edward Fergus and the equity audit were focused on um, students with disabilities and discipline. So those were the models that we had to work from. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much. No. I have a question. It could be partly for Jim and Libby, but um, as we look at more of the disproportionality data, what what kind of um, feedback do you want from the board? Like, what what do you see as our role um, in the process? Well, I, I think Libby and I were just talking a minute ago, you know, one of the key questions that we asked you is to think about policies and systems and those things, and that is in the board realm, is to think about those policies and structures that have in place and the impacts that they have on people down the line, right? So there's that component. I think you're as much a part, if not more, of the equity conversation than our entire community. And Jess has a great plan that incorporates a lot of touch points and a lot of feedback of different groups and opportunities. So I believe the board will have those as well. But Libby and I were just mentioning that this could be a part of your priorities conversation as well. You may identify mm -hmm. some things out of this that you want to do. I think another thing that the board can do selfishly for the four of us is like, this is slow work. Um, and we need some patience and support in doing it right. Um, and we really want to do it right. We're all really invested in this work. So I think just having that support from the board would go a long way, too. So Mia's question made me think a little bit more about just the language that's being used. And I realize this isn't something that you know, we developed as a district. We're adopting. But disproportionality itself is neutral, right? You either are disproportionately overrepresented or underrepresented. But things that, like I was thinking, like the risk ratio, right? That's that sort of falls into what I think of as like deficit mindset, right? Whereas, like, like Amia's question about like what if the risk ratio was high for belonging? Like, is the risk of belonging is that good? Or you know what I mean? So it's just like trying to think about how. We talk about disproportionality. Um, Ironically, this guy literally wrote the book on deficit thinking. So that is one of the things that we went through before we did this training with Adam uh -huh. that we did not do with you. So if there's anyone that I feel has a handle on deficit mindset, yeah. it is the author of this system. And I think what's challenging is you know, to properly show the board the disproportionality data, we would really need four hours over the course of a week to do this. To yeah. do it in one hour before dinner, <laughs> a little challenging. So I, I, you know, I would beg for some patience on that yeah. and, and just that we're going to be back and we're going to be digging into this a lot. So. I would, I would also just add to that. I think the risk ratio, it can so easily be and has been so easily been across the country explained away. Oh, that makes sense that young people experiencing poverty yeah. have this, this, this. That's where deficit thinking comes in. If we aren't slicing the data and recognizing where is the disproportionality by risk ratio, then we allow deficit thinking to take over and hold, right? So we're saying, no, actually, young people that are experiencing poverty should not be overrepresented or underrepresented in this way, and we need to fix this. It is not their identities that lead to them being overrepresented. It is our system, yeah. right? Got so it. I think that's a big piece. Is it F R L P? 
for your reduced lunch. Okay. And what's ISS and OSF? In school, school suspension. Out of school suspension. Yep. Okay. Sorry, Mike. No, go ahead. <laughs> and what's ELL and for Forma are ELL? English language learners. Yeah. Okay. And what was the last? What was the last one? The, well, the next two there's like Forma, or former, oh, former ELL. <laughs> 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 yeah. Sorry, I'm just struggling with uh, what what exactly you are. Thank you, though, Tim. That's like we live and breathe these kind of yeah. things. So yes, yeah. keep asking those yeah. questions. <laughs> and the text is going to be even smaller. That's right. <laughs> All right, that's helpful. Thank you. I mean, that where that was where I was kind of. I don't have a necessarily a question, but as a board, we should think about how we can talk about it in a way that's digestible for a community. Like, I'm an English major, and I saw disproportionality, and I was like, I think I get what that means, but it's, it's a big it scary is. word, and. Yeah. And it doesn't, and you don't want to start to slice things and have folks feel like there's finger pointing or whatever, you know. So we'll have to find a way to talk about it. Um, I'm saying this to myself as much as anything, in a way that our community understands what we're actually talking about and what we're trying to address, and not just blame or complicated data things that they may not understand. That supports our strategy of going slow, mm -hmm. methodical, and being really thorough about it. And one of the things our group was talking about is also not jumping to assumptions based on that, but needing to like, so this data then shows us to ask more questions to dig deeper, and that's where that slow part comes in. Yeah. Right? So we don't want to stop at certain places to maybe know that there's a cause and effect. Is now an okay time to ask a question about one of these tables? Sure. Um, it's on the kind of like the third page. Um, it makes the third table down. It says, relative risk ratio of students perceiving discipline by free and reduced lunch. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks to me like the paid group is at a much higher relative risk ratio than free and reduced. That's correct. Is there, I mean, that's striking. Um, do, do we know anything about that? What would you like to know? Like, why? <laughs> That's that deep question to get to down the road. We need to ask some tough questions about that. I think what's interesting about that data point is in the community, you might hear some narratives about the low income students being the behavior problems in the schools or having those challenges. And our data shows that that's not quite what's really happening. Interesting. But does it have to do with the, um, the way that lunch? certification was done like the last couple of years where it's indirect you know we have direct cert data that is arguably more accurate than when we had people filling out forms so they're qualified through the state and we use that data as the identification through the income census but, and also like no one is paying for lunches right so it's just it's just the way the language is particularly with the federal Government. Yeah, these are federal government terms. You still to refer to this as free, reduced, paid. So it's basically who would qualify for free, who would qualify for a reduced. Mm -hmm. yeah. they're, they're being paid for by the state, not not the yeah. feds, right? Right. At this point, mm -hmm. so yes, still being paid by the state. I think a couple of questions that raises for me are sort of. Like we talked about in the small group, what are the relative numbers? What what's what are the raw numbers behind to see, for example, if the if the reduced number, I'm making it up, is like ten people, then maybe the numbers don't you don't want to rely on them as much if there's a small sample size. So my my questions are sort of, are you looking at sort of the raw numbers to kind of correlate your confidence in the numbers by the sample size, mm -hmm. and are you also looking at this by school? Or is it generally approaching this as a district-wide conversation? So we started with the template that was at the district level. And the argument is, um, so this is, is there disproportionality? Yes. Does it matter if it's one or two kids that are impacted? If it's only one or two kids, that should be really easy for us to fix. Right, yeah, that's the question. Did you say easy to fix? But like, um, suppose there's only one um, 
student who is American Indian in the entire district. Mm -hmm. And that one person, you know, has been <coughs> referred for special ed. So it's 100% for that population. Is that a problem to fix, or is it just? It could be, or it could be questions for us to look at, or a trend to pay, be aware of, or something to consider. It's not something that necessarily needs to be fixed right away, but it could be something that we need to be aware of. Like, is there something there? Is there some bias that we should check into? There's just some good questions that come from it. It's not necessarily an action to to implement an, an intervention or a change, but it's an awareness component. A lot this of this is about awareness. Are there like sample size, you know, parameters or um, in, the, in the guidance that you guys are using, um, does he discuss the role of sample size? He says that this system is set up to identify if there's disproportionality, yes or no. But I guess from like, on the school basis, it could be that, you know, the UES, it's way above one. At MHS, it's way below one. So district-wide, it looks right on target, but maybe in the different schools. It's, so is that, are you looking at it in that way? We haven't yet. But is that, is that part of the? We could, we could consider what that looks like and see how it slices up, but we haven't done that yet. No. No, it's really interesting. I think there's a lot of different ways this can go. I was just saying, I think that would be really helpful because at different ages, different kinds of issues come up. Mm -hmm. I do want to be cognizant of time. <laughs> and I also be cognizant of the fact that this is going to be an ongoing discussion. I think the, you know, the big thing right now is to flag that you're doing this great work and starting to get and kind of you know, orientate the board towards what it means. Um, I think we'll have plenty of time to delve into this. And, and yeah, I, I absolutely agree that um, awareness is key and, and asking more questions are key. So um, with that, should we move to the priority setting part, which I think we're going to do in Thank you. sticky Thanks, Dave. and so I think the best way to organize this is, I believe Libby got some stickies and we have a little flip chart. Um, maybe I can just go and, where are the stickies? I'll just give everyone yeah. a little thing of stickies. Got it. Um, and people can just maybe spend five or so minutes writing down their top, say, five priorities, and then we can go stick them on a wall and start to see what emerges. Does that make sense, Mia? Are they the ones that the yeah. three she sent? Are we coming up with new priorities or are we are we voting on the three straw poll? I think Mia had a problem with this. Yeah. I think we yeah. already yeah. have. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, I think it's like priorities, like issue priorities I see. As, okay. as opposed to Sorry. yeah. Uh, does that yeah, that's the three priorities that we named last summer, that's not changing. Those are like our big picture mission priorities. Now we're talking about when you think about this coming school year, what are the things that feel most important for the board to tackle? Yeah. Um, and I think we should just say outside of the budget because that one's like without question. Yeah. Right. That's we wouldn't have to have that in our top five. <laughs> that one's definitely going to happen. But it would be other things that are on your mind or you've heard from the community or in reading the data that we've just been presented with, maybe. Because, yeah. um, of course, as Mike said, this is heavy, slow work that needs patience. Um, yeah, what are like the top five? Yeah. Yeah. If, if you're just the four is, is less than good, but she's okay. really interested So in this I'm giving five stickies or three stickies? <laughs> Give five, because we, 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 we all, we I think we will boil down to three, but I think five will give. And is it, if we do something that's pretty much what we were trying to say, do we just add a, like, attach that sticky? Like, if you and I write down essentially the same thing. Yeah, we can, we can kind of Start to cluster. It. Yeah. Okay. Cluster. We'll group. And you don't have to use all five if you yeah, can't come if, up with yeah. five things. That's okay. Yeah, you can use as many as you want, up to five, and then. 
Mia, you want to text me yours, and then I will write yours down. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, I'm going to think. No, I, I didn't even notice it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go that way. <laughs> that would make someone who would, who would have a, a turquoise colored product. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, you're in the shirt. Hmm? You're in the shirt. It matches.
Jill's got some more. Start. Paste fest, are people feeling done ish? Do you want me to have people share out and I can put them on there? Or do you want to just do it all as big group? All as big group. All as big group. All right. And, uh, if you see something similar, group it, otherwise, you can just do a little rework after. I think I think it uh, I dissolved together. Sorry, I definitely wasn't looking all over there. I wasn't either. Well, I saw a couple that looked similar. drone footage of that big <laughs> paper there on the table. <laughs> Do you want to stand over there, Jim? Yeah. And okay. So this doesn't help you me yet. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so it looks like we have not Shockingly, some pretty um, Don't we like type them as you read them yeah. out? Or These groups, huh? Yeah. Should I type them as you read them out? Yeah.
Um, since no one can read these from afar, I'm just going to talk yeah, about I'll them. Yeah, I'll type them and I'll email them. Okay. Uh, so we've got a cluster of about five for um, exploring a potential merger with Wash Central, E32. Um, we have seven that basically are our community engagement goal. Um, we have five about the um, basically about facilities with four of them specifically um, talking about MHS and the floodplain, one of them explicitly mixing MHS with potential merger. So um, I think the MHS and the merger conversation have some overlap. Um, we have Oh, wait a second. there's a random one here. We have six with the MHS facilities question. So um, we have four uh, on equity. Um, we have seven that encompass, oh, sorry, six about um, RBS with two third themes emerging. Um, one is the transition of students and the second is the future of the RBS building. Um, we have we have as we should some focused on well, we have kind of a few focused on academics. Um, two on academic rigor and academic excellence. One on special ed, and one on student achievement. Um, so I'm not those might mean different things, but they all are in the realm of academics. Um, Then we have one which I think is probably focused somewhat on the RBS question, which is building a two community reality. Um, we have school climate, belonging and wellness might be related. Um, investing in guest speakers or presenters to share less well-known information about the events that happen throughout the school days. So I think that kind of goes to uh, communications, important clubs. Um, field trips, uh, long TAs, uh, and more awareness to major issues in school and what steps can be taken, um, like vaping in bathrooms, discomfort at school, um, surveys sent out to people, etc. So, looking at this, merger, MHS, community engagement. Um, and RBS seem to be the biggest ones with equity close behind. Um, academics in kind of a universe might be, I think people might be coming at it from a few different angles, also close behind. And then we've got a few that I think plug into those but are a little lesser in terms of the votes. Um, how, I guess, how many priorities should we set? And I guess kind of some thoughts in terms of setting priorities. One, um, just because we don't put it as a top priority doesn't mean we're not going to do it eventually. I think it's just kind of what we're gonna focus on out of the gate. Uh, I think some questions about uh, you know, one issue that has been coming up, I think in private conversations and um, I don't want to call Kristen out, but she mentioned it when she, she left the board, was um, we're busy folks, uh, and it's and the burden on, on board members is a lot. So I think in terms of you know, what we want to tackle and how is, is something, you know, this might go to the second part of the discussion in terms of like how we go about decision making, but um, you know, I think in both setting our priorities, we have to give a lot of thought to 
what we can actually take on, the time frame, um, you know, how to prioritize. Again, um, you know, we, just because we don't make something a priority doesn't mean we don't do it. Also, kind of in thinking of some of these things, uh, you know, some some are going to be more work than others. You know, for instance, uh, you know, merger with Wash Central might not actually be a lot of work this year. It could be, um, you know, kind of forming a committee, gathering some information, uh, and it might be a, a fair amount of work for a couple board members on part of that committee. Uh, but the real work might start when we actually get you know the information and start to you know go out to the community and, and asking the community how to process that information because right now we have. Yeah, you know, we just don't have a lot we can bring to the community. Um, so it, it may be a big thing, but it may be a big thing that doesn't feel like a big thing for the whole board for like you know, 10, 12 months. Um, you know, similarly with, with MHS, it might just be hearing information and seeing what our options are. Um, you know, community engagement is probably going to take a fair amount of work for the board because, you know, we've talked about a committee and, you know, how to do that. It might change some changes in practice, et cetera. Um, so again, yeah, uh, you know, how many how many priorities do we want? Uh, you know, think about the fact that uh, I think one of the challenges we have with kind of the, the workload is it's all great stuff. It's it, but um, you know, but we don't we're not we're not able to do all of it. And and I think it's probably best to do a few things well, realizing that uh, we don't have to do everything within the next year or two. Um, and kind of what's what's most urgent, and also like how do we start conversations where we can you know have the administration start to build information or other people build information so we can you know, move processes along later. Um, so how many do we want? And then I guess the other thing is is what are they with kind of those work work uh, uh, work and resource constraints in mind? Um, and yeah, you know, remember the budget this year is hopefully it is not what it was last year. Um, but I also don't think it's going to be a couple short meetings where we say, great, we're done, and, and we move on. I, I think the budget is probably going to be a, a large part of our workload uh, between now and, and at least January. So I would just open it up. Like, how many priorities sound right? And I, my, I would throw out three, no more than three. Um, and I would say if it could be like two that we think are going to be pretty big lists for the board and maybe a third that we want to get something going on, but with the anticipation that it might be a bigger lift in a year or two. That's what I was thinking, two big ones and one not so big. that of those, assuming that the budget is a fourth? <laughs> assuming the budget is a fourth, yeah. So the, 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 the future of RBS question, I don't know that that's necessarily a priority, but there are, I mean, there are a lot, I don't know, I don't know where it fits, right? I don't know if it's one of the top three priorities, but the, the likelihood that the school remains in the budget doesn't at this point seem that great. There are a lot of things that could change, maybe not, but it's still is going to involve a lot of details and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of effort. And, and Roxbury has a lot of questions and there's, there's a, there's a desire among many to sort of, you know, take ownership of the building and in the most positive possible way for the community. I think that's the, the hope of the board and the hope of Montpelier in general. There's just a lot of pieces there and I don't know how that fits into a, it doesn't seem like, I don't know that it's necessarily a, one, one of the top three priorities for the whole of the district, but it's a, maybe it is, because I don't know how much work it entails, um, but uh, there's a lot there. Um, that's kind of, my, the district's kind of maybe going away from it, but there's a lot of stuff that is going to be need to be sorted out, I guess. And I don't know where that fits. <clears throat> I don't know. The what school I'm board is the is the decision maker here, so it, in my mind, in the fall, that has to be a priority. Yes. It has to be because if we are talking about budget season, we have to the board not we the board has to figure out. So 
I wouldn't downplay that, Brett. I think that's yeah. super, in yeah, my mind, you, that's super you important. You want to do it in the best and most fair and, and helpful way for everyone involved that I think that we all can. There's a lot of un unanswered questions and uncertainties and, and legal questions, I think, um, mm -hmm. that need to be answered. Is that something that the Roxbury Transition Committee has talked about? Um, the, the, right the, the town has formed a, 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 a town-based committee to sort of explore ideas and think about it, and we, there was a meeting on Tuesday, and there's just a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, a lot of questions that, not are, that are, aren't, the answers aren't going to necessarily come from the will of the board. There are questions that are process questions, legal questions, questions about, you know, what, could, what can the board even do? Those are, there are some questions there. There's just a lot of unanswered questions, um, it, which, which if, they were well, if they were answered, it would help, I think, the whole, the whole process along. Yeah, yeah I think the, the challenge or the work for, there for the board are making sure we're asking the right questions and getting the right answers. And then when we have them, you know, making sure that we're involving the right voices in whatever the decision is and, and hearing from, from the right people. Because, um, yeah, I, yeah a, lot of, a lot of the questions about, you know, how a transfer could take place, what, you know, from the agreement, you know, it's like RBS or Roxbury could buy for a dollar if they want. I mean, the, there's some things out of the district control. If, if Roxbury does not have an interest in assuming that building, that's a different question than if they do. Um, yeah, and then what exactly does that look like? Because I know there's some, some questions around that, mostly, honestly, for kind of the lawyers. Um, but, you know, yeah, you know, that is, no one other than the board can, can determine, you know, at least from an ownership perspective, how that, how the future of that building um, plays out. Because the, the, the cost could be pretty significant for Roxbury just to just to take ownership of it, even for a dollar. It's not yeah. about that. It's about the cost of not it's the cost of not letting it go into disrepair, mm -hmm. even over the course of a year or two. As and maybe more because there's this community use clause. What does that mean? Can you get any revenue from it? At all? There's a lot of questions. Yeah. And another question that we don't have answered is, what if Roxbury doesn't want it? What, you know? And how do you find that? How do you figure that out? How do you figure that out? And I, I have to go back to the agreement. I mean, I mean, I think that even if the town is to buy it for a dollar, the town has to vote on that decision. And that vote wouldn't happen until after the budget. Yep. So can I can I ask a clarifying question? Libby, you were saying that it's the board who's the decision maker. It's about as whether or not the district holds on to the building or releases it, right? That's the decision the board would need to make. Yep. Is at, that at correct? The, at the most logistical level, taking all yeah. other things off the table, and there's a lot of other things on the table, but just all those yeah. things off, the board will need to decide by the time you decide on a budget whether or not the maintenance of that building is in it, or is it in it until we sell it, or is it in it until a defined date when Roxbury takes it over? Like, the board's gonna need, it's, yeah. it's a significant budgetary line item, yeah. and the board's gonna need to decide that by January when you send your budget to the town clerk. Yeah. And backing that up, I think we need a lot of information I'm in no way able to make that decision based on what I know right now, like what the range of potential uses are within the district, um, you know, what the utilization could be for Roxbury, what it would, whether it would it be attractive on the market. Um, like we need some kind of, right, presentation on, on that piece, but I guess when I was thinking of the 
Roxbury transition. I see that as that's like the one half of it. But also, I was so impressed with all the work that I read in the minutes that the Roxbury transition committee has been doing. And I think it's really incumbent upon us having taken a big step last year to kind of really keep on that because for the best of intentions, things can go sideways, you know, and just making sure that we're hearing from folks and be making sure that what we land on, you know, if that we're, we're able to pivot if something's not working and so that the experience of the, of the kids and families that are coming in is, is a positive one. So I think it's like a super important short term, I mean, with long term implications, of course, but like, it's one of the more exigent things, I think, that we have to deal with in the, at least the first half of the year. Yeah. Yeah, it's complicated, and there's still a lot to be decided. And, yeah, and, and, and since we pushed it through this year, I think it's incumbent upon us to do our due diligence and follow it through to the end. Yeah, yeah no, it is, it's a building that's under our stewardship, and, and we have to make sure it's it's taken care of. And you know, obviously, the town of, town of Roxbury has a big decision. But if the town of Roxbury does not want to take over ownership, um, that's a that's a very different conversation than if it does. And it's hard to know because I know that the people that get together are a small number of people, and they're very invested in it 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 be, being an integral part of the community. But that's a small number of people, and I don't know, you know what. I don't know how to even figure out what the rest of the people think or. I know that there's a lot of people that can drive a lot forward. It doesn't take many people to drive a lot forward, but I don't know if that's fair or I don't know if that process, trans as, you know, I guess it can be a transparent process, but is there, are there voices that aren't being heard? I don't know. Yeah, and I think also bifurcating what our job is and what Roxbury's job is. I mean, I don't think it's the district's role to you know, other than the fact that you know the agreement allows for it to play a role in, in what Roxbury does to do, it. and I, and I think I until agree with that. Roxbury comes to us with a proposal to to transfer the building, our assumption is that that we have it and we're responsible for it. And I think the question is, at what point, at what point in which Roxbury does not act upon that clause or express an interest act by that clause, can we determine that we are free to transfer it to someone else if we so choose? So I would recommend that it's, it's a priority. That this is a priority, <laughs> an early priority, yes. um, and that um, <clears throat> we need to spend a board meeting asking questions and getting them all down. Yeah. And then... Um, move from there this fall. So I would recommend the board names that as a priority and we talk about some other things in there that would make sense. Yeah. I think we have, have given a lot of signals to the community and I think there's a lot of appetite in the community and I think that the MHS question and the, the merger question are linked. Um, we, I think, got a very good study from Truex Collins on the MHS question. Um, so we have some, some good information there. I would say that the merger should be another priority, and I think this is, at least at the onset, a light lift priority because we have to form, what is it, like a 776 committee or something. Um, but get that process going. It will probably require you know a couple board members to be involved, but uh, it's a conversation I think both communities want to have. Uh, and until we get the basics of you know, what are the potential tax savings, what are the potential building uses, what does this space look like, you know, how could we, what are the various configurations that may or may not make sense, it's a really tough conversation to have beyond the speculation that both communities have had for the last 50 years. So I would say at least you know, reaching out and getting that process started. And, and again, I don't think it's, I don't think it's something that's going to take a lot of work time this year. Next year could be a very different different issue, but I would say getting that process should be a light one. And then how much we want to say the future of MHS is 
part of that or, or not. Um, you know, we may want to wait until we get all that information and then, um, you know, next year just have a very, a much bigger conversation when we have the Truex Collins study. We have a lot more information on what merger looks like, then really delve into earnest about, okay, what is, what is, what is the future of, of the high school and the configuration of this district and, and our neighbor's district. I wanna- As this pro process of setting priorities goes, Jim, on, the, on this big board you have there with the, the ideas for priority topics group, it seemed to me like there was already some natural movement toward some top ones just by the, like, even as I, we were going to try and maybe see if, it, if voting made sense, but it's looking like already there's a fairly sizable consensus around um, RVS uh, merger slash high school. And then was the, is there another one that's a fairly high quote unquote vote getter already, even though we haven't actually voted? Community, community engagement, I would say, is, is up there too. Okay. And maybe that answers the question I was just going to say, because to me, the RVS is two related themes, but they're very different. So one is sort of the mechanics of the building and the impact on the budget, but like much bigger in my mind and what should be a priority is this sort of experience and this transition for these kids. It feels very, you know, fragile and tender still for very good reason. And I want to make sure we don't just... You know, I think we need to at least acknowledge that um, and do everything we can to ensure that that's successful and continues to be successful, separate from the yeah. literal building. Yeah. Like the, the experience of those kids is, should be paramount in our priorities too. And maybe that's part of community engagement, actually. I don't know. I, I think that's, a, I think community engagement is, a, and I think for the board, community engagement is a piece of that. Community engagement and just making sure we're we're hearing from the communities and being responsive and asking the right questions of the administration about what they're doing. Because it's, it's, I think it's our job to make sure the community is heard and concerns are being addressed. It, it, you know, it's, it's not our job to, to do the work in the classroom and um, you know, on the ground to make it happen. We just have to make sure that, that voices are being heard in that process and, and what's happening is, is making sense and, and getting the best results we can for our kids. And can I ask, were folks thinking when we were talking about MHS and the merger, is that, is sort of part of that bundle, the literal like climate, I mean, I put one up there about like, just like very practical matters, like we had to close school because it was so hot and we had a flood the year before. So like, can we assume that that is part of why we would want to consider what to do with this building because or does that need to be a separate priority, I guess, is what I'm asking. Would that be something? I would, I would say that's kind of wrapped in to... Sort of the future of this building. Yeah. Too. Okay. It certainly would impact it. Yeah. And I, I feel like, you know, we paid for two studies this year that I know of. One was buildings. So I think we should use that information while it's fresh. Right, because a year from now, it's going to be different information. And the second was the equity report. And so, um, you know, if we're going to pay for stuff, I think we should use the information and, and focus yeah. on that, those things. I, I'm not opposed, though, to, I mean, Roxbury is obviously yeah. really important. But I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah, and again, I think if we set these three priorities, this does not mean that we are not still mm -hmm. heavily pushing forward our equity work, heavily, you know, pushing forward. Um, you know, the work on student achievement, on special education, uh, you know, those are all you know, big things and, and things that we need to, you know, keep continuing hearing about and keeping an eye on. So do those three make sense to folks and then we can go into the State the them again. Making process conversation. Can you say them again? State them again, please. Uh, the Roxbury transition, which is um, the questions that are squarely in our court about the future of the building 
and how that would play into the budget process, uh, as well as just you know being a I think this plugs in also to the community engagement piece. Just make sure that we're being a place where we are ensuring that that transition is happening in a manner that is 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 working for the the kids and families in Roxbury and the kids and families in Montpelier, um, and uh, you know that that folks are being heard and their concerns are being you know addressed in in a, in a manner that that's. Uh, you know, responsible and reasonable, and, and and making sure that you know kids are getting a good education and, and safe education, and um, you know, uh, uh, you know, being being in a good spot. Uh, the kind of merger building conversation, um, the kind of future configuration of the district, and and getting the information we need to have a really robust talk about that, probably you know in the next. You know, starting in the next 12 months, but uh, you know, taking the opportunity to explore a merger through a 776 committee with Wash Central, um, you know, using obviously the information we've gotten on MHS to inform that, uh, and then getting whatever ever, of other information we need, uh, and then you know the community engagement piece, building out that piece of our of our goals, figuring out what that looks like, and making sure we're going to kind of have a really robust plan. Uh, for the board going forward, and some parameters to uh, ensure that that happens. Am I? Is it so? The merger is that supposed to be the third, like not as big one? I think it's not going to be huge because a lot of it is just information gathering. I think once we get the information, it might be a very, very big conversation. I'm just worried about what the weather might add to the conversation that we can't control. <laughs> Like in less than twelve months, or in twelve months. Yeah, and I mean, we, if, if the high school floods, we have to react to that. I'm not. I'm not sure that. I mean, I think there goes in, you know, implicitly there are just going to be things that, that hit us that we you know, need to deal with. Like for instance, the the mess with the budget last year, we did not map out, and that ended up really occupying most. To be fair, there was no way we could have mapped that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We did not map out because we didn't Zero way that could have, we could yeah. have anticipated. Yeah, no, and likewise, uh, you know, if it, it's very possible that we could have a flood that exceeds July 11th and have this building be put out of commission for three, four, five months or maybe to the point where we don't want to come back. I'm not talking just flood, like, you know, too hot or, you know, whatever. Like that was last minute, right? Like the, we, the heat was predicted, and we had to, you know, Libby had to come up with a way to make the school safe for students in, you know, very little time. I think it might be my specialty. Yeah. <laughs> That's I think we talked last year about that was something we were going to take up the sort of emergent versus non emergent closure protocols and whatnot. So I think, Monty, that's a good point. And, and I and I think that's an area like, even if it's not a priority, I think it makes a lot of sense to, I think we also talked about, you brought up about like a, like a coup plan, right? A continuity of operations if, if there does come to be a flood. So some of those things I think are important work tasks that we could still peel off. Yeah, yeah now again, just because we're making priorities doesn't mean that we're ignoring other things. And Jim, just so I'm understanding this, when we're saying priorities, I think we're just mean like this is what we're working on. This is where we're going to focus our work, right? Because exactly. I mean, These we all pri like our, prioritize, our yeah, yeah. All, all manner of things, yeah. 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 Like if, if you're running a political campaign. These are the these are the big things you're telling people you're going to do in, in your in, in, the, in the upcoming term. It doesn't mean you're not going to otherwise cover. Yeah. You know, in the budget stuff last year, um, uh, it was pretty brutal. Um, and it was coming at us very quickly, and we made, you know, a lot of hard decisions. Um, but the one thing that I felt was a positive from it is that we, as a board, were making some decisions. Like, it was under duress, for sure, but we were, like, you know, thinking about things, looking at evidence, and deciding stuff. And um, that was exciting, you know. So 
um, for some of these things, I know they're going to take longer, but if there could be like, you know, points where we actually do decide on, on next steps and, and, you know, actually concrete stuff, that, that would be great. I think it's kind of a good segue into the next part, which is, um, unless do it further on this, and then I think we kind of have two bleeding into each other, but uh, you're at 610. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to, before we segue completely away from it, just say as a process point, this conversation has given Jim, Libby, and me the information we need in order to establish the work plan of the board for the, the year, which ends up looking like basically here's what we're going to tackle in each board meeting. And that's a draft calendar that everybody has access to. And so, for example, on this idea of what's the continuity of operations plan, we would maybe take a board meeting to discuss whether or not that's something we want to direct the administration to do. And then the administration would take and run, you know, come up with a plan. Um, but it wouldn't necessarily be something that we would have, um, you know, several board meetings devoted to where the board is making that kind of a plan. But in the in a another example would be on the question of RVS. That is something where we would have need probably several board meetings, maybe even community forums and things like that, in order to say make the decision that the board needs to make. So just to give an example of how we'll take the information that we're getting from the, from this conversation right here and lay out the work plan for the board. For the board. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Is there anything else on that? And then I can do my best to tee up the next conversation and then Mia can uh, fill in the things I missed. Yeah, so um, I think both in kind of going through some of these priorities and in uh, kind of looking back on some past decisions, uh, I think, you know, kind of two, two real examples come to mind of places where uh, we had big things hit us in different ways. And I think certainly on paper we had a lot of process around both of them, but in terms of going into both situations, there wasn't a lot to kind of guide us on what sort of process we wanted, what that process looked like, what our criteria were for actually making the decision. Um, you know, kind of the two being the track and um, the budget. You know, the budget obviously hit us. The track was a different situation where students came to us with a, a proposal. Um, you know, we, we kind of had a, a variety of discussions and meetings on it. It, it blew up online in various different ways. Uh, but we never really kind of when, when the issue was presented to us, had a path where we could say, okay, you know, here's something that's, you know, it's, it's a big budget item, or it touches on the student experience, or it does X, Y, and Z, therefore, when we interact with the community, we should do X, Y, and Z to make sure that, that folks feel heard and that there's you know, kind of a logical, rational process uh, that dictates it. It was a little each, each situation where we were making up a little as we were going along. Um, and uh, we were taking you know, different inputs at different times and, and kind of you know, changing course and uh, adjusting. And I also think that you know, the, you know, the obvious negatives were uh, there were a lot of folks out there who didn't necessarily feel that they were heard or they knew what was going on. Um, I also feel that we were sometimes a little reactive uh, rather than, than proactive. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, and, and again, I, th I think we just felt a little, little rudderless through, through the process. Um, so it would, it would be great, you know, if, you know, to kind of think about, you know, what are the, what are the criteria we want in terms of making a, a decision, both in terms of you know, what are the process points we want? Um, what are the, the values we want going into it? Uh, and, 
you know, how do we kind of feel at the end of the day that, that we've checked boxes? And then you know, with some other considerations too, realizing uh, some decisions, you know, kind of as Jake was alluding to, some decisions we do have to be reactive to and the time frame might be short. And this could kind of go into our criteria, you know, like how much time do we have? Uh, how necessary is it? Um, you know, other decisions like the track were, were not as reactive. I mean, there were things we had some time to think on uh, and get out ahead. Uh, and also, you know, some ability for, you know, even to do things like say, okay, you know, anything over $1.5 million that we've got time on, let's take the community and have them vote, just so we know. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily suggesting that, but that is, you know, if, if we kind of had that type of, of criteria, that would, would guide a process like that, and I think make it somewhat easier for the board to know what to, to do a certain situation. So, um, my suggestion is that we just kind of have a brainstorm about, you know, kind of the, the type of things that we want as values going into a decision. Uh, some of the things that we would want out of a, a process. Uh, and um, some of the things we, we want as kind of criteria that would put us into to different categories. Uh, you know, things such as the amount of money on the table. You know, what the subject matter is. Is this something that affects students' daily lives or is this like a routine maintenance matter? Because a $2 million expenditure that is, is very apparent to the daily experience of our families and, and children might be very different than a $2 million expenditure that has to do with replacing a roof that obviously would affect kids, but it's, it's, not, it's not like a directional or an educational decision. Um, you know, clearly, you know, closing, closing RBS was a financial decision that had a very direct impact on children and families. Um, you know, remodeling the auditorium was, a, you know, another big expenditure that was more making sure, I mean, it, it improved the lives of our students, it, it was very important, um, but it was the type of maintenance that, that just has to be done. Um, so, uh, you know, think about some categories, uh, think about some values, and think about the type of, of process points that we would have so that we, when we go into something, we have kind of have a bit of a flow chart that the board has, you know, if this, then this, that would be hypothetical and could apply to a variety of situations. So we're not just, so that way, you know, if we, if we have, say, the track, we can look at it and say, well, you know, not urgent, a lot of money, the ability to, to go to the public, uh, you know, therefore we do X. Whereas, you know, something like the budget, like urgent, you know, not much time to act, uh, needs to get done, um, and, and, you know, have perhaps a different flow chart for, for something of, of that nature. Um, Mia's suggestions on improving that, or does that sound good? I'm, I'm thinking we could maybe just take five, 10 minutes alone and do that and then maybe get into groups and then come back together and, and see what, what has emerged. I think that, I think breaking up and thinking about it on your own is a, is a good start. I think it might help if people had specific questions to answer that lead us toward a process. So for example, we have, I, I, think, you, I think you've laid them out, but maybe it would help to put them right. up somewhere so people know what they're answering. Um, so the ones that we have thought of that we need to know something about in order to be able to determine whether or not we go into a more involved process is what are the criteria that a topic needs to meet in order for us to start a process? And then what are some questions the board would want to answer that we would use a process to answer? Who do we want to be hearing from? How would we do that? And those, this is, these are the things that we would do then for community engagement within a process. Um, is there an ideal timeline for, for this? And then what are the roles within this process, including who is the decision maker? 
So those are the main ones that we've come up with that we can, again, I think Jim having people like think about that stuff on their own first, uh -huh. and then we can come back together work. Um, but I just wanted to be clear about what we're asking people to think about first. Think about first. Yeah. Hey, can you say this again? I'll write them down. Yeah. Um, what are the criteria that a topic needs to meet in order for us to start a process? What are the questions that we'd want a process to answer? Who, who do we need to hear from? How do we do that? And what can we do if we're not getting input from those folks? Is there an ideal timeline? Last one is, what are the roles, including who's the decision maker? And then just one other kind of context note, and this is a little bit of a like transparent facilitator moment. This is, we're kind of experimenting here because what we're asking ourselves to do is try to lay out like the skeleton of a process we could place into just about any topic. And so of course, like the questions that we'd want a process to answer are probably going to vary on a case by case basis, but are there some that from the board perspective are maybe like evergreen that we'd always wanna make sure we're, we know about? And then of course, if and when we enter into a more involved process, we would come up with other questions. This isn't like we're sketching it all into stone and this is the only thing we're gonna use going forward forever, but we needed to, as Jim was saying, give ourselves a little bit of a skeleton to put something on that can then also be flexed depending on what the actual topic is. Yeah, yeah and I think the tricky part is gonna be kind of building in that flexibility so we feel like we still have a process even though situations are different again you know something might fall into like it would be great to start a process over this thing but you know one might be a controversial three million dollar project versus a three hundred thousand dollar uncontroversial project like how do we how do we not treat those the same so that either we're shortchanging the community on the $3 million process or turning every small decision into a huge process it doesn't need to be. Does it need to be formalized though? Like if it's a 300,000 versus 3 million, don't we inherently know that one is 10 times more serious than the other? I think sometimes, but I think the, I, I think like getting some parameters on what we inherently know and, and inherently don't know is is important because I, I think the thinking we inherently knew before was a little problematic. And then and then it also I think insulates us a little from the the, the project that maybe like 70% of the community is jazzed about and has no problem with, but there's a very very loud 30% that goes berserk and we're very reactive to that. I also think um, a three hundred thousand dollar project that constitutes a, a, a deviation from a path that we've been on is a bigger deal than a three million dollar project that is a continuation of a path that we've already defined. In a sense, I don't know yeah, exactly. Sense, yeah. <clears throat> like in terms of the vision work that we've done and. There's a lot of stuff that we've tried to, yeah. there's, a lot of, there's a lot of foundation here that we've already tried to establish. We have priorities, vision, we did a lot of work with Nathan, a lot of the equity yeah. work we've done, 
Um, there's a lot of sort of path that we're trying to sort of establish that we're trying to, we're trying to like lay tracks in a sense into a future. And if even a $300,000 project is a, is a strong deviation, <laughs> that could mean a, we need a bigger engagement. Whereas 300, 3 million is exactly what would be expected based on the work that we've been doing over the last three to five years. Everybody already knows. Yeah, so that could be like a criteria. Like, is this is this consistent with you know previous work or a previous priority of the board, or is it new work or new priority? Because um, I think you're right. I, I think if, if we've if if we put a lot of work into going in a certain direction, there might be some investments where they kind of naturally follow, and even though they might look like whoppers in terms of their numbers, we can look back and say, well, this is four years worth of work that this is building on in a very logical next step. Whereas there might be a smaller investment that's kind of like, well, wait a second, like the district had never done something like this before, or this, this seems inconsistent with, with what we've been doing for the last four years. So, so why and, and how does it fit in? The one other thing I'd add to that list of questions is how do we decide what the question is I think it's I think that's so important that I think when you have one of groups that are different on a subject it's because group A thinks the question is one thing and group B thinks the question's a wholly different thing and so trying to get that early in the process like what what we think we're answering with either a project or an initiative or something I think is is one of the most critical pieces I'd like, I think we should think about in this. Yeah, sort of defining, and I don't want to say problem, because it may not be a problem, but like, that we all sort of, before we do a lot of work, let's all define the, the question doing? before us that yeah. we need to answer or something like that. You know, for those as uh, criteria to find a process, one might be what is, what is the issue, what is the question? Yeah. I think that can be tricky sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take this up. And probably a lot of people read it. Uh, and what, what, 10, 15 minutes on this? Does that sound right? <coughs> small group type of deal? Should we do small groups or just we all individually brainstorm on paper? I like that because we're kind of a small group already. Yeah. I think either partners or small groups would be more productive. Let's do, let's do partners. Let's pair off. I think there's 10 of us. Eleven. Twelve. Twelve machines. Yeah, they're eight board Not, not coming. Because Kristen's out here. There's eight board members now. Okay. Right. Yeah. So what's going to make something rise right to the top, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially, is what we're saying. Yeah, and and I, I, what I was thinking was another thing how to how to determine how to how to determine how to how to determine 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 how to determine
same well, yeah. Yeah. It's like a combination of all of these. So that's why right. I, right. So right. I look. So that's why I'm just sort of making like, all right, what, what are those different dimensions that we have? Yeah. I liked your or, or sets of that that are how long we call it. So like you would say something before you guys start going down all that we have. Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe it's also what I was thinking, like, if everyone who's impacted. Okay. I, I was thinking, it, it, like, there, there may be curricular issues, mm -hmm. or, you know, it, that, then it would be students. Mm -hmm. For me, students, I got you. Yeah, and then I started with stakeholders, which is kind of like, I guess, like, I mean, kind of everyone is a stakeholder. There are, like, key groups, right? If it's something that. Like the budget, students aren't voting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Students aren't voting, and right. there are like a lot of community members who don't have students in the district who are. Mm -hmm. So those stakeholders might be different mm -hmm. in that conversation. Than you generally buy in the state. Oh, I've got to take the So they can see the process. So then maybe the main stakeholders will say. Okay. And I just, just I think we got a lot of problems in the conversation just now. There was a lot of discussions around the money. But there's a lot of things to decide. You know where I stand. Yeah. So the pants were on purpose. Impact on either a really large impact on a small thing or a medium impact on a large thing. So that's why. Yes. Exactly. And so so that's why I was thinking about the impact of the split, not just who's impacted, but how you know. So that's kind of where I was thinking. And that's where, that's when we joined. Okay, well, maybe who's impacted mm -hmm. and to what extent or something like that. Um, yeah. That's what I meant by it already, but. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, oh, right, yeah. clearly. Um, yeah, so the, I think these two are saying the same thing. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like else. Like mm -hmm. the grand like, you know, you know, you gotta do it. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's why this is criteria. I, kind of like I just like the whole. Usually two times per day. Like well, maybe that we There's a lot, there's a lot that yeah. 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 that community engagement question because that the power of 30%. Mm -hmm. I wake up at 5 15 for work. I like come if we have that community engagement dialed in a little better, that 30% is going to look like can be 30% right. and like not of, of massive power. power. I'm not sure exactly how to get there, but uh, that's the part, it's got to be part of this process is that we have a way to shield the board from, you know, those loud, loud, loud voices you can feel when you need to. And most of us then see how we reckon with those, but it's not as much pretend like. Tell work that I have soccer, like that shit sale. I think we're going to um, have a good varsity team, and but and I don't know. I really it's like the JV coach, too. Yeah. Just so this is sort of right. I feel like the information that are here in Rosalind. So the ones we have in the so I mean, I definitely have to talk to and I feel like criteria first. Well, I think we kind of did that today. I think we could make that now. Next year, it's based on the fell track. It's budget. Is your feeling that the cockpit is more pressure for the community? Yeah, I mean, we kind of we kind of did this informally, right? So maybe the, maybe the key is like first getting a small nation, and then so you have to kind of see it and see it. No, 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 that's what a lot of people felt. The, 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 the sky feeling of the moment, right? Which can be influenced by clothes rocks. Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and like, yes, yeah, maybe the mental is the amount of social yeah. like, yeah. yeah. number of negative from <laughs> point four to one. Well, community input for sure. I actually think that was the first one, decision. So then, so mm -hmm. 
I think, well, these are almost one and two, right? It's like, what are the yeah. issues? In, and then the criteria are mm -hmm. in here, too, like financial restraints, mm -hmm. constraints, and, and um, kind of community uh, relevantness <laughs> or interest mm -hmm. or support or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Using a bunch of phone balance oh. to buy them tax yeah. tax. Responsible. So, no, no. But, but I think I see what you're saying, and like I do, I think there's a relationship between the money, the amount of money, uh, the I'm, nature I'm of the money. Also thinking about like who. Yeah. 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 It's big money decisions. Um, who are the people that we can have like allies and partners? Yeah. Right? Like maybe it's the so state. That would be this. Yeah, that, that's kind of where I started to think about like what do we need? Yeah. Do you need the board's vision and value or like? Yeah. What do we need? And this kind of I feel like is we can answer this only after we answer these, right? Like. Well, we have to tell let people know what. So we're from the district, I can just. Do yeah, exactly. And service so that is coming out. So I almost feel like there's like the <laughs> stages, right? There's, there's like the, there's our moral imperative there's like the to information that gathering, that graduates right? We kind of get RPS this piece and we decide, all right, what's the, it's what's our the cost, right? The, who's impacted that sort of stuff? And then once we have that, then we have some deliberation, right? So you know, it would be nice, though, to think about, like, I don't always want us to be responding to emergencies. Yeah. You know, it's like, we should make space every the year, work of the board. or whatever mm -hmm. big thing comes up that we didn't plan on, mm -hmm. but then also, you know, like, maybe we're going to put more effort into particular areas or some big thing has to happen in terms of curriculum mm -hmm. and training or mm -hmm. you know like I think yeah, we have to somehow to, when we think about who do we need to hear from I mean obviously we're the, mm -hmm. um, but the community members too yeah. because they're the ones who fill the bill right and parents mm -hmm. and um, students legislators um, you know, right. members of, of like, do we bring in, did process. anyone come from the state? Okay. I can't remember right. our budget process, but we did have, we had several forums. Uh, 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 yeah, where we did have, right. have folks right. come what in. Are the questions that we it was an expert process. process. Well, I mean, it wasn't. The, the whole process, we did spend yeah. a considerable amount of time for like several months. That was the, the, the final decision. Well, was quick, but... Like, so if we do, who do we want to hear from? It would be the community um, school personnel and students. Depends on what the issue is, right? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm looking for markers quickly. When my hand was out here. So I guess maybe if I'm thinking about that large that question about who we want to hear from, there's, in my mind, there's Number three. two broad groups. Yeah. Who do we need right, to hear from? There's the people oh, from the community, the community that, that, that we How do we do from. that? And then there's How do we the people do that? from outside of the community that we want to invite in, right? right. And so maybe it's not necessarily... And any professionals. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So maybe it's not, we don't need to know who the people are specifically, but it's like the, yeah. So... Um, Internal tax parent, payers, parents, <laughs> <laughs> school personnel, and um, yeah, I mean, the, the internal might be staff or, or students or teachers, uh, parents, community members who don't have any, you know, family and but then it might be in some cases, and then the external might be you know, federal professionals in the field or. State yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so I almost feel like they're just like, like, like this piece, what we, what we can sort of gather, then the, like, who are those folks that we need to bring into our conversation, and then we need to have some sort of deliberation within the board once we've got those pieces. I think the timeline is really going to be budget-based, I mean, because it has to be planned into the 
like it's going to run on the budget cycle in some ways if it costs money. Yeah, like depending upon what what the issue in question is. If it's an issue in question that doesn't cost a lot of money but might have a significant, you know, impact on, on the community, then it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily tied to the budget cycle, but our job should be it should be within a certain time frame, a defined time frame. Does that ultimately tell us so this piece I was a little un I mean we're talking about board decisions so yeah right. and I think um, you know we need to be clear like we don't make curriculum decisions yeah. and stuff like that right mm -hmm. so it's I think being clear what our role is in terms of what we have control over mm -hmm. and what we can make decisions about yeah. and then who the other people are who have to implement maybe yeah, some things that we suggest or mm -hmm. expect or of the right. action yeah. and the time and place to comment and if people don't I mean to I almost feel like this is more like a this is more of a like a binary right like it is does it fall within the like purview yeah, of the board to make like a decision and if so then make a decision otherwise like then it needs to be delegated to like if it's a regular decision then, then we can we can collect information and then pass it off to the yeah. schools where the, where the decisions are actually made. yeah and the community should be part of this yeah. too mm -hmm. so I think the decision makers are um, you know the superintendent the board and the community well depending upon the, what the issue yeah. is yeah I mean they all of those people will have input but ultimately, like it's if it's a if it's a vote on the budget, then ultimately the budget vote is a board decision. Well, not pass it. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the making yeah. budget. Exactly. Um, yeah. 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 And I suppose at some points it could be students also. Yeah. Yeah, there should be, again, depending upon I mean, it's big sort of the bigger school community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when you have something that is at that scale, where you're all like, are we running on a virtual bond to do it? We didn't have that much cash in there. It's called the second. Um, D E C I S. Yeah, that's a really good that seems like the right path because that's what a normal school would do. For a That's uh, good. <laughs> because I don't always <laughs> have it on that <laughs> level either. <laughs> it's good to know they're yeah. real people. <laughs> oh, yeah. How does it Because it, it actually thwarts the check. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, but I still think you Response bias, like, These chairs are getting really hard. I, know. I forgot to bring my little cushion <laughs> thing. Do you want me to go get you a cushion one? No, I'm going to just yeah. tough it out. Are you sure? Well, I think it's right there. You can go grab me one. It's on wheels. Got it. You stay here. I got it. That's my usual way. Here we go. This is good. I
Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm just going to put an order in for one of these to be at the table every month. Again, I think that's on a sliding scale of urgency and you know. Is there another important set? I think once we engage the community, yeah. there's like a limited yeah. Yeah. shelf life. Yeah. 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 By the yeah. time yeah. I found yeah. out, yeah. I found out that there had been a year process because some of the presentations or something. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 So yeah. I was already like, like yeah. 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 exactly. Oh, I'm excited. Yeah, exactly. So, like, I think it goes with the idea that, like, hey, we can do this. I think we're starting something, like, do a big sort of splash so that people are on notice that something of consequence is being decided and then try to move it with her school without undue delay. September so that we can retain the She's like the last of her vendor to go. Yeah, yeah, they're all going. She's going to go. But um, yeah. anyway, her dad's going to go out with her. Yeah. 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 so much yeah. 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 And they're going to hang around it. He's going to make sure. You know, he lives in Delaware, so he's going to, like, kind of clue her in a bunch of stuff in San Francisco. And then her mom's going to take Friday and Monday off of school and fly out. He'll take her to school. So just checking out folks a little more time or feeling couple more minutes. All right, perfect. Um, yeah, I know. She's it's just really so weird. Or as soon as possible. She's just, she's um, great. And, and this is we started this moment on the end. But he, he's, 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 he's still got a little prefrontal <laughs> cortex. <laughs> <laughs> and Let's and take then, longer. We just had the last well, six weeks. What do you think about the role of the school? Well, I'm still going to be around. He'll be us doing it. So it'll happen. Yeah, my kid was a junior this year, too. Yeah, you're starting to see the numbers. Yeah, no, he's a bad. It's a typical building. I'll pay it. 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 I'll pay So he got it a was lot better. I hope he was better. Where do they are? How far away do they live in relation to us? How far away from us? Yeah, like Yeah, I think they have a apartment building. Like that. So I was like, they kept two stories. It was actually very reasonable. There are two houses. Oh, okay. 
So it's not like I think we get enough and drive it as well. So, yeah. Well, they're out in the middle steps. Uh, but it's really good. Yeah. 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 And now we can drive. How old are the kids that you're not there all day? Yeah. 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 Yeah, and we have a neighborhood called the Pools. I really like it. So, since I had And if it has to be virtual, then we'll have a little And so cheap. Okay, I'm sure I have a lot of noise from the Pools. Like our first lunch there, we got. And the Pools say, we know. Don't talk to me about that. I told you. So, I'm so glad. Jen, you can smile at her. She's just terrible. It's true. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there's like a big garbage can out there. I just don't want to leave anything in the library because they're not checking yeah, it right now. Yeah, right now. Yeah. Yeah. She just doesn't work. And so it's with family and for the university. Yeah. 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 Um, so it was great. Uh, and it was really great. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Oh, you think I was about to say that? Oh, this is not the same. It's a populated area for that to be happening. Yeah. It's a little trail of Were you guys like, uh, it was like animals heading from it was wherever they uh, come, yeah. that sometimes they cross the river. Oh, and then they me. go up, there's a ravine. Are you waving me up? I waved to her when I walked by. I think we're going to be by the back. So there's a couple of reviews like that. Way. There's one along um, Liberty Street, too. Yeah. And so they just use those as their morning and evening. Yeah. 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 And then someone kind of pointed out that that's when the New Hampshire soldiers fought a battle in the war. And also, I think we're going to have I know Natalie's going into her senior year, and we're all of a sudden getting like, oh, what are you thinking about it, but very abstractly, and I was like, oh, you know, 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 you Yeah. 
But of course, I'm, we're all purple. Yeah, yeah, right. I was, I got yeah. waitlist in this school, so then I went to that school. Sure. And it was great. Mm -hmm. And it kind of felt like this big, you know, left turn, but it worked out fine. So if you don't, we're trying to go. She, she, she was very right. next to my house. Like, we're just down the street. And I just told her about that. I knew that was on Park Tiger, and she's just half of the Park Tiger. She's like amazing. Oh, like, almost feel like she's like, she's like, she's so we have to speed up to get out. Right. Then when you're like 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 is everyone ready? Yeah. Right. Um, so it's self should we just go group to group and we can't. We couldn't read I know it's it's, it's <laughs> Uh, I don't understand why you can't read that. It's like disappearing ink. <laughs> <laughs> I would tell you, Jim, if ink on that. We're doing an observation of your <laughs> classroom. We would be having a conversation about that. Let me tell you. Yeah. I would say, <laughs> who's, who's me with better, give me the Sharpies. <laughs> provide me with better materials, yeah. Soup. <laughs> thicker, thicker Sharpies. Yeah. Darker colors. Yeah. Um, so the first question is uh, criteria that um, to start a process. So why don't we start with, well, why don't we start at that end? <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. So I think of three questions. Um, when I'm wondering if there needs to be a larger project, a larger process, the first one is, is it a deviation from our vision, vision approach or values or from the multi-tiered systems of support? Because that's, foundational to our advancements in you know, supporting academic success and emotional, social emotional success. The second question is, are there adamant feelings for or against either in the school community or in the broader community? Um, and that is where that 30% that makes a loud noise um, raises a red flag for us, you know? Um, it doesn't mean that that 30% is going to drive our decision-making pro making process. It means that there's 30% out there for any, any particular, you know, situation or circumstance um, that's really, really adamantly, and I don't know what the number is, maybe 30% is a high number, but somebody's making a lot of noise about something, that should raise a red flag of one kind or another. So that's the second question. And the third question is just the straight dollar expense. So... Uh, you know, what, it, and, that, and that has two parts, right? Like, are we talking about general fund or are we talking about debt, the possibility of debt? Like, for instance, building a new high school or something like that. So those, those three questions, to me, if, you know, and that's not the only way to approach it, but those are, those are three questions that you might ask before you decide whether you want a larger, more comprehensive process. Yeah, so just have a kind of consistency with with goals, values, multi-tiered system of support. Yeah. Uh, and then kind of red flag feelings in the community. Community support. Or yeah, or, support, or, or 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 opposition. You know, vehement opposition is a is a flag for us, I think. And then dollars. or vehement support. Do you want me to type these and maybe I can join the meeting and like share it? Yeah, I'm doing that yeah, too. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. I'm writing them down here, but yeah, hopefully it's slightly It'd be great to have it on, in an email or something. Okay, so some of the things we came up with, and Jill can add, is um, kind of board role or responsibility. Does it fit squarely in that, or is it, you know, administration or another decision maker? Um, I think you can present 
amount of board discretion? Is it a have to or a want to? Because yeah, we might have some have tos that have big dollar items and some want tos that have small dollar items but are controversial. Um, and then is it kind of consistency with previous work, previous goals, or is it directionally new or unexplored? So I was going to say question of, I was going to say consistency of direction. I think I missed one when I was joining, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, the first one? The first one of ours? Yeah, was that what you're, so uh, I have, is it a have to or want to consistent with previous goals and direction? Yes. Um, I think your first one was, is it a board role or responsibility versus administration? Yeah. And then level of direct impact, level and type of direct impact on community families and children. Which I think would encompass the dollar. You know, is it, is it a big tax ask? Is it something that's going to you know, change the daily lives of, of kids? Is it a decision like busing that could really affect families? Um, could we add faculty to that too? Is from our group. Um, I have me as if you want to write yeah. me as real quick because they're similar to what you and Jill talked about. Um, cost. The board has a role to play. The board has a decision to make. Uh, does this fall within one of our priorities? And what is the actual question we're trying to answer? So being clear on the question. Who's impacted uh, and to what extent and what resources are required human power uh, non-financial women I can't read the last little thing there you can't no I can't <laughs> I think I stopped writing what was the last one I Scribble. You can't read it. Okay. <laughs> There's something incomplete in it. thought. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it got captured in the others. <laughs> oh, I think it was going to be um, partners and allies. Mm -hmm. yeah. it says it. You saw you said participant, or you said presenter, panelist, whatever. Uh, Jacob. statement about it um, and then we also thought at the beginning of the process it's important um, to know would most people generally buy into the problem statement like to get a feel for right off the bat whether it's something that would get community support and whether we're kind of articulating it correctly
So I've got consistency with, with goals, with multi-tier system of support, um, kind of community support, community feelings, which I think is also what I'm about to view. Uh, dollar expense, uh, board role of responsibility, amount of board discretion, you know, does, which I think ties into, does the board have a decision to make? Um, consistency with district values, uh, level of direct impact on kids, families, communities, which I think goes into who is impacted. Um, time involved. Stakeholders, partners, and allies. Any concepts there that are that I missed? One more. Oh, and you guys haven't gone yet. Sorry. I think, oh, you're good. I think most of ours were said. The only one I also have that goes into impact is how does this decision affect our community's most vulnerable members? Mm -hmm. I don't know where that would go. But the rest of them, yeah, just like the impact. How should the impact influence our process? What steps in this process are our role on which should be delegated or are not ours to make? Let's go to the questions we want to answer with the process. Want to do it in reverse? Tim and Jake, you want to start? We'll... Yeah, we came up with, is the problem urgent? How does it fit within our goals? What are our options? What is the cost of doing nothing? And how does the community feel about it? OK, cost of doing nothing. Consistent with goals. You said one I missed too. Is the problem urgent? Yeah. How does it fit within our goals? What are our options? Our options. That's a good one. Okay. What is the cost of doing nothing and how does the community feel about it? Scott and Lynn. So, so Lynn, Lynn and I, I guess, are mavericks here. We kind of, so we thought of the first two as really the same, right? Yeah. Like the, the questions to ask are all of the things that we just listed out. And so, yeah, we didn't separate them. Yeah. No, that's fine. I would probably just add who benefits. Yeah. So I think Jill and I had also consistency with district goals and values. Um, not just urgency, but necessity of the project. Like how much discretion do we really have on like a roof fix? Um, are we being responsive to community members? Uh, have we have we received the information we need to make a good choice? And does it benefit the kids in the broader community? Which I guess goes to who benefits. Do you have anything I missed? Mia has. What are our options? What does the community think? Cost at greater detail, specificity. How else could we use that money? What might the impact be if we do this? What might the impact be if we don't? And how can our values guide us in this decision? Right. 
I don't know. I'm still stuck on like <clears throat> when we need the process, and what does the community think? Is I don't. I don't have more to. I don't have more. Right. Um, I don't have more either. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. said. I also kind of thought they were the same thing, but they're similar. Mm -hmm. Okay, who do we need to hear from? Let me start with you guys. Community members. And, yeah, students, faculty, parents, um, non-related community members. <laughs> We don't know how to do that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think we have a very good mechanism for getting community input. Or, or, I don't, I don't. I'm stuck on it. So I think we had similar community administrators, educators, and staff. Kids, which I guess is students, and experts. Um, what did we have? Did we? Staff, okay. admin team, families, students, full community. Uh, Scott and. So Lynn and I. <laughs> <laughs> Don't start that way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I and Lynn. Um, I think it, it really depended on what the what the question was, and so we kind of stepped back and said, depending upon the question, is going to dictate um, who we need, who we want to hear from, and we thought of it in sort of two broad categories. There are folks from within our community, and then there are those folks from outside of our community, and so yeah, again, it's very very you know the budget. Unfortunately, students don't have a vote on the budget and community members who don't have students in the district do. And so that questions around the budget might be very different than questions around um, something that is directly related to student experience, where students have a very big say in it and community members outside of, uh, that don't have students in the districts might have less to say about it. And I think um, the admin, did you say it's administration on there? Because there are mm -hmm. things we don't decide, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Jake and Tim. We thought that um, that uh, related, depending on the size of the issue, like in dollar amounts, if there's a dollar amount, that kind of dictates um, how much community engagement is needed. Bigger dollars, bigger community. Um, we want to hear from subject matter experts, such as district uh, employees and external experts. Um, and when we do talk to the community, it's important for us to present well-baked and fair options. Okay, so what happens if we do not get input? Can I add something to timeline? Sure. Um, I think it has to kind of fit with our budgeting process. Right? Like, 
the timeline for things has to I be. I think that's next, isn't it? Oh, did I skip some? Yeah, I thought yeah. you, sorry, I was yeah, jumped in. Yeah, we, we're, we're doing that next. Um, so what Jill and I had was, what if we don't get input, like, do we have the info we need to make a decision? Um, have to, we should ask ourselves if we've done proper output or outreach. And the necessity or desirability of moving forward. You know, do we feel this is something where maybe we're going to get input because the community is fine with it and they've got better things to do on their Wednesday nights? Or is this something we have to do anyways? Or is this something where we feel that if the community isn't paying attention, we don't have to do it, we might want to put in a holding pattern for a while and, and see how the thing shakes out. Uh, Scott and Lynn, or Lynn and Scott? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, this last time we did outreach to the community, right? Like someone went to the senior center, mm -hmm. and I think things like that are important. And for the, uh, the things on Front Porch Forum and the articles in the bridge, all those kinds of things I think were really helpful. I mean, as hard as it was to get 400 emails a week, <laughs> um, I think it was really good that people spoke up and Anything else? Uh, Mia? Mia Bielby. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm honored. Um, surveys, community forums, board member office hours, student forums during the school day. I would add on to that that we have to get, one of the things we've been talking about is that we have to get better at going to people instead of having people come to us. Going to the library, going to the co-op, going to different streets and neighborhoods with flyers and QR codes and a tent that says MRPS, come on over and talk, go into the coffee shops. ask the question differently. Um, I, think, I think firstly we should always consider why we're not getting input and is that in or out of our control? Could you speak a little louder please? Oh sorry. We should consider why we're not getting input and is that in or out of our control? And um, like Libby was saying, how do we make giving in, oh like Mia was saying, how do we make giving <laughs> input um, easier or more convenient? One more thing I'm thinking oh, sorry, about, right. just if we don't get input and we, what is the, what is the, um, what is the timeline for executing a decision, right? Like if the, if we, if we make a decision, if we're not executing it for two years, are we then going to get a, is that going to cause a lot of problems? Whereas if we can make a decision and then execute it in, in an expedient way that that's a different those are two different circumstances so ideal timeline or maybe like rephrasing kind of like what should go into determining the timeline that we set up process just to, to go back to I don't think we went for the uh, we're not getting input Oh, sorry. Did I just skip you guys? That's what happens when I go out. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> I think just providing clear notice and um, how we would like to accept comment, just you know, being really clear about what the best way for folks to engage with us and kind of maybe making a big splash when we do have a decision. And then for, honestly, for like bigger ticket items, 
consider following or bonding or following the bonding practice of going for a direct vote um, because that is a um, it's good for us to have that direct touch point to the community when we're going to commit a substantial amount of resources for a capital project that's a process that's known and in place and so I think we can use it for a million dollars yeah we think because a million sounds like a lot yeah seven figures yeah, no, I, I think that's good advice. I know it takes a lot of our hands, but um, it is. I think it's a surefire way to make sure every community member who, you know, wants to go to the polls can say it. And if, yeah, it's also the surefire way to actually, like, I think, shield ourselves from critics who say we haven't done the output or the outreach. Um, Okay, uh, ideal timelines. Why don't we start with you? I have one thing to say about oh, that. Oh, cool. yeah. I think sometimes a vote might not answer the question that we're asking, so I think we should consider that. Like if we're asking more why or something like that in a process, that might not be the most effective way to answer that question. Also, yes, I can check. What's the question? Sorry. Yeah, we can't see it. Timeline. I think Rhett had a good point about, like, you know, is it something that we are needing to get or hoping to get feedback on, like, in the short term or long term? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How urgent is it? Um, like, what are... What are the steps? What are the steps and who are we depending on to make it move forward? Sometimes we have to wait for like some different ballots or something. <clears throat> um, is it in the budget or out of the budget? I guess. Or is that does that make sense? If it's if it's within the a year's budget, that's one question. And if it's bigger, that's maybe a multi year question. I'm not sure. Yes. So we had um We, we also had, how does it, does it have budget implications? Um, what other decisions might be depending on it? Uh, and how does it influence other potential decision? Um, and also, what's the time that we feel we need to actually gather the information we have, like the complexity of the issue? You know, if it's something where, um, we would want presentation from a lot of different experts on a lot of different issues. Uh, that's going to take more time than if it's you know a, a more straightforward decision where there's kind of like one one touch point in terms of complexity. Ideal minimum is six months, question mark. Some, uh, for example, Washington Central would need much longer time than that. Uh, some could be flexed to take less time, probably. He was very indecisive about, <laughs> about that one. <laughs> six months, shorter. Case by case, it's case by case. <laughs> Depends on the question. I don't know why I'm reading these for you. <laughs> You're still here. You can be reading. I don't know. Yourself. I guess I know. I could be saying this all out loud. I thought I thought we were going to follow a different process. Yeah. Uh, also, I don't mind. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we're under this this fictional thing that because Libby's in the room, she's the only one who can hear. Uh, <laughs> uh, Lennon Scott. Um, I just had, it needs to kind of fit in with our budgeting process. And um, 
And I think also, I don't know, maybe this is on there somewhere, but sometimes there are curriculum initiatives that take place over several years, and so somehow the idea of a long-term project kind of has to fit in there because it'll be something that'll have to be funded over time. Hmm. Which kind of goes to other things that might be dependent on the decision. So if it's, I would say it's an investment we need to make in order to start X that we all decided we wanted to start, that might be different than um, yeah, what if we're going to build a swimming pool? Not that we're going to build a swimming pool. Right. So. right. This is the very first meeting I ever had as a superintendent, not doing your expert, somebody coming in and saying, hey, you need to build a swimming pool immediately. Why has school a swimming pool? I mean, that brings, that does bring up the question to me of whether what, what's the, when the board is encroaching on the role of the superintendent and because, like, the board didn't really necessarily envision, you know, create the multi-tiered systems of support. Um, and, and so those are, those are, those are also questions. Like, and we passed a lot of budgets that supported that, including a lot of investments with Faith and Libby, you know, which we didn't have a process for. And, it, it, and the way it rolled out, it rolled out, Libby was like, I'm gonna ask for this much this year, and I'm gonna ask for this much next year, and that's the way it happened. So is that maybe another question we're trying to answer? Is like what our role yeah, maybe that's it's a it's kind of a role question. Is it us or or not? Anything else under time? I was, uh, to, you, guys case you guys are talking about it. It should just be possible. It's basically what Mia said. Um, we our thoughts on the time ideal time timeline. Um, to try to broadly publicize the start of the process so that people aren't reacting like at the end of it when it's actual decision time. Um, and then move with reasonable alacrity, which I think means speed. <laughs> I think the idea of not being a never ending thing, but try and if we have a limited window with the public's attention, try and grab it and get what we need. Yeah, and I like, because I think there's something that we didn't do with the track, that we didn't just say, we're having a process. It came to us, kind of like, kind of inched into a process. And I think that publicly announcing it, saying, we're having a process, we're having three meetings where we're talking about this decision, here's what we're talking about, and if you want to show up and say something, here's 20 minutes, and here's the, you know, and we're going to go out, we're going to put in the newsletters, we're going to put up some flyers, but I think that announcing, announcing the process and what it is is very important. Yeah, I think people can stomach, like, not getting what they want better than feeling like they never had a chance to make their case, yeah. you know? What's our final little thing, because I think, um, what are the roles? Who is the decision maker? Yeah, I, th I think Jill and I kind of incorporated that into the criteria because if it's if we're not the decision maker, it's not our role. Um, we probably shouldn't be having a process around it. But <laughs> Lynn and I had a, a similar conversation. Although it, there's oftentimes stuff will come to us as a board, we, we will deliber deliberate, but ultimately it may not be our decision, and so then it's our decision, it's our job to delegate it to Libby or whomever. And so yeah, it's like, what's the, what's the question, what's the issue? Is it a board decision? If not, yeah. then who's the right person or persons to pass it on to? Yeah. I think Jill and I kind of thought that's a long criteria. Like, totally. yeah. I think we were thinking, um, more in terms of like the board structure, that if it's something that is our decision and it's within the jurisdiction of one of our committees, that the committee kind of becomes the experts on it yep. and chews it up a lot and not necessarily to provide a recommendation, but to be our subject, our like own subject matter experts so that they can facilitate a conversation with the whole board. 
Well, there's also circumstances like with a merger discussion that has, you know, that has to start off with a prescribed statutory process or like Act 46 had a very you know, prescribed process that, I mean, it was ultimately a board decision, but the process was to follow the law and the law had a process that, that was set forth. Um, anything else on roles, responsibilities? Just going around. I have a couple. Yeah. I feel like the broader question mostly implies these, but like, do we have the power to make this decision? Is there a better person or place than us to make this decision? And what laws are going on? So I think we've got a lot of great stuff down here. Um, I mean, I think the big meta takeaway that I have, and I don't hear from others, is that what we need to do, we need to set out, I think, well, probably the first thing we need to do is put these all in question form so that we, when we get a question, we can look at it and start to go down and talk about it as a board and then use that to basically say, are we beginning a decision-making process or not? And if so, at the time, kind of looking at these factors, say, well, what do we want this decision-making process to look like? You know, how, what sort of input do we think this decision needs? Uh, you know, how do we want to get input? How broadly do we need to get input? How much time do you feel we have to make the decision? What's the ultimate best way to make the decision? Kind of that question, like this is when we want to get input, but ultimately we might want to put it to the voters. It belongs to us. We might want to delegate it to a committee and just start that really up front. So that way, when we begin a decision-making process, you know, I think the track's a perfect example. You know, the students come to us and present a great idea, and then we say, this is a great idea. Is this something we want to take up? Okay, we want to take it up. What do we want that to look like? And here's what we feel, based on all of these things, it should look like, and kind of here's where we want it to go. Um, did that generally make sense? I have a question at the beginning of that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> like, you said, is this something that we want to take up? Um, would it need to be consensus on the board that we do want to take it up? Or, you know, what is there a threshold there? Like, suppose in the track process, I wasn't here, but suppose one or two people said, you know, this could be problematic. Does that, you know, put a, put the, a halt on it? Or what happens in that instance? I think it would be kind of case by case. I mean, um, the way I would envision that is, is we probably would start by consensus. And if there was just unanimous consensus that we want to do it, and we feel this is kind of the way we want the process to look, and everyone on the board seems to be on the same page about that, I think that's all we need. I don't think we need a formal vote. I think if we got to the point where there was dissent, then we might just want to take a, a formal vote. Because, um, I will say, folks, I just monitored the policy one yes. for agendas and things for our next board meeting is that there's two different, uh, you could take a vote, right? Or the board chair has the right to put anything on the agenda yeah. that the board chair determines is important for the board to discuss. Yeah, which, which would probably be a last resort unless it was the type of thing like say the board didn't want to talk about, and this is not true at all, 
So the board did not want to talk about the selling the Roxbury Village School building, but the administration was telling the board chair that we may have to do that legally. That, that's the only type of situation where I can see the board chair saying, well, we're, we have to make this decision. Or say the, the board was like, we don't want to do a budget this year. Uh, <laughs> but I think, I think other than that, we, I think we'd want some sort of, not, not a unanimous, but certainly a hearing from a majority of the board if they want to do this and they want to look like, like X. I think that's where the framing the question up front really well comes yeah. in because I think it's a, it's a well-functioning board, so like that that kind of back and forth, maybe Scott sees the question as this, but I see it yeah. more as that. And I think that process is what is the best way to drive the consensus to, yeah. and, and also will serve the purpose of a more crystallized question yeah. of what it is we're gonna yeah. decide. Yeah. So I agree that I think it's consensus on that. Yeah. Like we're getting out of the boats, it's, it's not, you know, we're already in a little weird place. But I don't think we should shy away from boats, because, I mean, yeah. it's, it's a community elected board. You could have one or two members who just are, like, hell no on something. Like, you know, that, you know that's, that's something we feel that the board and the community as a whole strongly support. Um, so that there might be times when we have to have discussion, but at the end it could be, you know, okay, there are, there are two board members who are, are not going to move on this, and, and we feel the other seven really strongly support it. So, uh, yeah, th yeah. Not, not off the table. I just think consensus is always the. Oh, yeah, that's, that's definitely the way to go And so I think that's where the framing comes in. Yeah. Because you probably bring everyone along. Yeah. Bring it up right. Are we yeah. talking about starting a process, or are we talking about a minority on the board stopping the board from having a process? I think we're talking about. A minority of the board, because you know, if to get to a, I mean, to get to a decision, we have to decide: are we going to make a decision, and then what's the process to get to the decision? You know, ideally, we'd get consensus on the board that this is a decision we want to consider, and there, there might, at the end, there might not be, you know, full board support for whatever we think the decision is. Say everybody, let's just use the track. Say, say we get consensus that everybody wants to discuss the track as an option and look into it and get more information, have a community process around it. But then at the end, two board members say, I actually don't feel we should do this, but the rest of the board does. There would be, I think the ideal process is, is we get that consensus up front. This is something the board wants to do and do it. But there could be an instance where, yeah. You know, Say there's a couple of board members who get on the board who are just like, hell no on merging with Wash Central. And and we say, well, you know, this is something, this is a question we, we want to enter into. You know, seven of the nine board members feel strongly that they want to gather information. They might not know how they actually feel about merging with Wash Central, but they want to learn about it. And there are two board members who are just like, not not gonna go there, not, you know, don't even want to start the process. That might be a situation where yeah, you know, if if they were, you know, if if after trying to, you know, convince those board members that you know we should at least start the process and get the information, and they can so no later, but you know for whatever reason they just don't want to open the door, that might be an instance where we get to a point where we're like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna have a vote on whether we're gonna do this and a vote on what the process looks like, um, and then move forward regardless or move forward in accordance with that vote. I just emailed you all the Thank you. Let me email it to the wrong place first. So. All right, squirrely. And I think in terms of, uh, probably I don't think of formally adopting it, I think, I think everyone should kind of review it. Maybe we'll talk about it at our next meeting and see if there's any fine tuning, and then we'll just kind of use this template for you know things that we decide are going to be board decisions, um, or actually use as a template to see if, if they're board decisions in the first place, and then if we do think they're board decisions, what that process looks like. Just kind of go through this this questionnaire at at the onset and just commit ourselves to um, you know to going through that process. 
every time we have something that, that may or may not be a board decision, you know, more than say, hiring a cross country coach. We might want to put some specificity on that in terms of big decisions. Yeah, I, I think big decisions, yes. <laughs> okay. I would say major decisions that go past what we've already committed to, like the budget, or that are just part of kind of consent agenda items. In terms of memorializing this, I'm maybe looking to Jill as chair of the policy committee. Is this do is that is this something that we'd want to consider in that context as like a a policy or I don't know. We can, we can give a thought. I'm not sure we need to go to that formal level as long as we is keep reminding true? ourselves that this is what we've committed to. Is this sort of just, a, okay. Uh, I, I'm open to it. I just thought, mm -hmm. how does this this set of things live? And Is it like an SOP or? Yeah. Or just our sort of compact? <laughs> like I, think I think it's kind of an SOP or compact. Yeah. It might be good to, to review the existing policies and see if this could kind of fit like almost as a procedure under an existing mm -hmm. policy. Yeah. Okay. But let's, let's give that some, some thought. Yeah, I'm not uh, advocating <coughs> for it necessarily, just trying to think of how this lives. No, I, I think it needs to live somewhere and, and in a place where we're not going to forget about it. Yeah. Is our next meeting the first day of school, the 28th? It's the 21st. 21st. Yeah. Which is Less than a week next, week. Week. Yeah. next week is our next meeting. Uh, next week is, is our next board meeting, and then a week after that is the first day of school. Okay. Which is slightly more unbelievable, but yeah, it's, it's, not right. not it's not on my calendar. Are you sure? Next week? The 21st is the board meeting, 6.30, Okay. Do we have a planning document yet? Planning, like a yearly document? Um, yep, it's in creation right now. Okay. We wanted to have this conversation, and then right. we'll plug we'll plug and play a little bit over the next week or so. I'm sorry, did you say the 16th? For what? We don't have a board meeting tomorrow. No, I'll have a no, board no. meeting the sorry. 21st. <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> um. Well, great. This was great work. I think we've got 20 minutes for wrap up, um, which is kind of unstructured. Or next we could steps. Huh? close re recap of decisions and conversations and next steps. Yes. So I was texting with Mia during the priority conversation, and it could be pushing it from my end a little bit. Um, but the, for the board meeting on the 21st, we would propose, and I'm speaking for Mia now because she's not here anymore, that um, the board take some time to brainstorm questions that you all need to make decisions regarding the building. The questions wouldn't be answered, they're just questions put out there um, that my team and I can get to work on and then move into the question of how does the board gather input from the community and what might a possible timeline for this decision be. So starting to follow the process that was just outlined. Yeah. So I, on the agenda that is sent to y'all, um, I linked the merger document in there just in case you don't have that to help you come prepared with questions you might need. I have a question about that, if I may. I'm sitting in a meeting in Roxbury and people are asking questions. Do I want to invite those people to this meeting or do I want to take the questions that come out of that meeting and provide them to the board ahead of time? Would that be a helpful way to... to I would say that board? part goes into how does the board gather input from the community and it, that might come at a later date. Yeah. I think these, this, okay. this, set, this purpose would be to get the board starting to generate questions. Does that make sense, Brad? 
I wouldn't mind hearing what well, has yeah, already I mean, come up. Yeah. My questions are their questions. Which is fine. Which, yes. which is one hundred percent fine. Yeah. Okay. So just come. Should I should I share some of some of those questions with the board ahead of that meeting? Would that be it? Or. Or just They're not going to be answered, so. No, no, that's fine. But I think just so that, that, that good. Yeah. Just, I mean, maybe provide them ahead of time. Helps the people yeah. get the yeah. get the wheels Could going. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not yeah. to have them answered, but just these are some of the things that are. Yeah. No, and and on the RBS process, and not to, um, not to put too much on you, right? Because I know you've carried a lot already, but you know, you're the board member that's that's you know going to Roxbury every day and and interacting with people. So your sense of, of the pulse and the concerns there are way better than any other board members. So, um, you know, and I know Scott and Lynn have some sense because they've been serving on the committee. But uh, yeah, so the extent that you three can share information, and we don't have to answer them in real time, but just I think the rest of the members hearing, um, hearing the concerns, you know, the mood, the, you know, just, just what, what people are talking about, it would be really helpful. So another another thought is that the um, the Roxbury Transition Committee was going to meet on the sixth. We decided we didn't have a lot to accomplish, and we were wondering about the twentieth, which is Tuesday before the board meeting. So maybe I'll warn that meeting and get the transition committee together to see where the questions are there. Does that make sense? Because if it's going to be the following day that there's going to be more questions asked, it's just a, another opportunity to. Um, get people seeking questions. It may be too late, not to be a stickler, but um, you need two days to warn it, so it'd have to be warned tomorrow, and Anna's on vacation. Well, only Anna can warn. She's the one who has all the keys to the castle there. I can try. I don't know if, I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> That's my big, I don't want to get it to not the yeah. wrong, all the right places. I can try. I did when she was on maternity leave, so I can go back to that document and just use that one, but that was three years ago, too. <clears throat> I mean, we can call it the school starts Wednesday the 28th. Oh, I wonder if anyone would have a stomach for the 27th. I don't know, I just, I, the, the, the Roxbury Transition Committee accomplished, I think, a lot in terms of addressing some of the busing concerns and addressing some of the after school concerns. And there are a ton of unknowns about the building. Uh, and now if this, if the, and, and then we, we said, we're gonna suspend the committee until school starts because we wanna be, we wanna be, we wanna support the kids as that actual integration happens and sort of continue to be an entity that can sort of, you know, be in between um, the school board and the, and the town and families. And frankly, I know um, a lot of people don't trust the board or the administration and they're sending a lot of things my way. Um, and um, the transition committee is really helpful for me in that sense um, because it, it, it helps me have some a, an entity that is not just me. Um, and it doesn't matter how much I ask people to send their concerns in a particular direction, they, um, they don't want to do that, which is self-defeating, but it's a reality. Yeah. So maybe we can try to have one and see who shows up on the 27th. Or the third, I just don't, I don't know if there's a rush there. Or the third. We can talk about that. Because it's going to be a long process, <laughs> as we just outlined. So we have, I think there's some time that could be had. Well. It's theoretically a long process for the for the board to bake a budget, but if that if there's a town vote involved, that's a separate. That's that creates a lot of complication. And so, what would the town? Sorry, what would the town would happen? Would it, would it happen on town meeting day? 
Or could it just be a call of the town? Maybe, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I don't even know what's legally required. These are the questions that need to be asked. <clears throat> Can the select board choose to purchase it without a town vote? I don't know. Yeah, and I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm not sure if it's, I don't think the merger required, the merger document requires a town vote, but I don't know if the. Yeah, I don't know if that's a tr true or just yeah. what, I, what somebody's yeah. interpret, and somebody's perception was. So does our board lawyer do stuff like that, figure that out? See, these are questions that need to go at the questions next, <laughs> next Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah, because it's probably in the charter that the town should, has to vote before like in the town's charter, before the town assumes responsibility of a property, they might have something that says we got to have a town-wide vote, regardless yeah. of what the merger document says. So. I'm pretty sure that's a town requirement, acquisition of real estate. I think often it requires a town vote. I think so. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it would potentially make sense. No, it makes sense in some ways. I mean, in other ways... It's one of the specific exemptions to go into executive session and discuss purchase real estate. So that's why I think yeah. it's like something that happens at that level a lot. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think there's a risk of making assumptions. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. An, an answer. I mean, it's just big. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say the Vermont League of Cities and Towns might be another good resource yeah. for some of these questions because it's about the municipality accepting that responsibility, not just a school district. Question. Yeah, and then this question of does, you know, is the, I mean, the town may not move on the same timeline that the district needs for, to answer budget questions. Yeah, then I'm just, yeah. And then I, I mean, I just want to be very clear at the town of Roxbury that, I mean, obviously the board has not taken action, but I think the district is very committed to upkeeping that building so long as we are the owners and you know, committing the resources to do that. We, we have no, no desire to see that building fall into disrepair under our watch. Anything else before we wrap up? Otherwise, I think we can maybe close a little on the early side. I'm sure we'll take those 10 minutes back Thanks later this pizza. fall. Like next week. <laughs> yes. Um, well, thanks, everyone. Uh, do we have a motion to dismiss or adjourn? Not Whatever the word is. Huh? You're not in court. <laughs> like sometimes, sometimes it feels like I object. <laughs> um, I move we adjourn. I uh, no, second. Okay. All in favor? Hi. Hi. Thanks, everyone.